Good evening. This is Chairwoman Julie Hen. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Wednesday, November 9th, 2022. I would like to invite the scouts and leaders of Scout Troop 828 Lutherville to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Two. Thank you to Scout Troop 828, who are here tonight to fulfill a requirement for their communication merit badge. Well done. Let's give them another round of applause. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and virtually, and broadcast online through Microsoft Teams and through BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is consideration of the agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I'm not aware of any changes or uh, additions to tonight's agenda. Thank you. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. And eight, consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation. The summary of the closed session and open session information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters and for that I call on Ms. Anderson. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Hen, Vice Chairman McMillian, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves, deceased recognition of service, and certificated appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in Exhibits D1 through D5? So moved, Stolesky. Do I have a second? Second, Hassan. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Frau? Yes. Ms. Causey? Abstain. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. Good evening, Madam Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, and members of the board. I am bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. The first position, Research Specialist in the Office of Research. The second position, Coordinator, Student Support, Office of the Chief of Staff. And the last position, Supervisor, Office of Peer Assistance and Review. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit E1? So moved, Hassan. Do I have a second? Second, Stolesky. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. Dr. Williams? Sure, thank you. Our first candidate is M. Maurice Owens, who is attending tonight. Please stand as the new coordinator of student support in the Office of Chief of Staff. 
Uh, welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools. He brings over 15 years of experience as an administrator and seven years as a classroom teacher. His previous position, he was the vice principal at Barnegat Township School District. Congratulations. Next, we have Andre R. Paragoy as the Supervisor, Peer Assistance and Review in the Office of Peer Assistance and Review. He's attending tonight with his wife, Danielle Paragoy. Please stand. He brings to us 15 years of experience in Baltimore County Public Schools, his previous position. He was a consulting teacher in the Office of Peer Assistance and Review. Prior to that, he served as a science teacher at Lock Raven Technical Academy and a science teacher at Parkville Middle School. Congratulations, Andre R. Paraguay. last candidate who is watching virtually tonight is Gregory Bushman as the research specialist in the Office of Research. Um, he had served in Baltimore County for a period of time, so we want to say welcome back to Baltimore County Public Schools. He served in several positions at the University of Michigan, including field coordinator of School of Public Health, data analyst, prevention research center, school policy and evaluation, uh, internship with the Child and Adolescent Data Lab and research assistant in the Department of Molecular Biology and Biochemistry. So welcome aboard, Mr. Gregory Bushman. <laughs> that concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Williams. The next item on the agenda is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who registered to speak to attend in person. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers are selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrations are received, all who registered will be permitted to speak. However, no speaker substitutions will be allowed. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask speakers to observe the three-minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. I now call on our advisory and stakeholder group leaders to speak. Our first speaker is Billy Burke with CASE. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Mrs. Henn, Vice Chair Mr. McMillian, Superintendent Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you on behalf of the members of CASE. I'd like to begin by congratulating the newly elected board members. I look forward to working with you. To the appointed members of the board, thank you for your service and diligence as the new governor appoints new members. And to those members that are finishing, finishing your tenure in the next two meetings, thank you for your servant leadership. I hope your next chapter is filled with love and everything that brings you peace. I'd like to make a few comments about the proposed calendar and its effect on case members and staff professional development. The board's decision to acknowledge holidays outside holidays identified in Comar is noble, but it has consequences. 
Making holidays professional development days for teachers lessens the impact of professional development. The teachers taking the holiday must find a way to access the information at another non-teaching time. That is almost impossible in the limited time available. It is compounded by the BCPS decision to reduce the number of faculty meetings each month by half. Administrators and teachers must still collect and analyze data and provide the professional development as identified in the school progress plans, but in half the time. It weakens the opportunity to learn and improve. As a member for the calendar committee, the addition of the non-COMAR holidays will almost always necessitate a pre-Labor Day start. There literally aren't enough days to make it work by starting after Labor Day. I know you received information from a teacher suggesting that's not true. I ask you to carefully analyze what he submitted. There are many things missing from the calendar that is proposed tonight. The one item of confusion that remains in the calendar is the decision to close schools for teachers and students on the MSEA convention day. We are familiar with past language for days when schools are closed to students, when schools are closed, and when schools and offices are closed. What are the board's expectations when schools are closed for teachers and students only? I suspect there will be less engagement in professional learning that day, which is the original purpose of the day. I would ask the board to check with the unions for unintended consequences when changing the calendar and to clarify, I'm sorry, and to carefully consider the recommendations of the calendar committee. With that being said, I, on behalf of CASE, support the proposed pre-Labor Day start calendar. As we approach American Education Week, I would like to thank all staff and the board for the commitment to children. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on the behalf of CASE. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Cindy Sexton with TABCO. Welcome. Good evening, Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Again, tonight I have three quick points. I ask this board, as you're going through the calendar tonight, to be cautious about any changes you may be considering. What sounds good or right in the moment will likely have far-reaching effects that you may not have considered. Seemingly, everyone has a strong opinion about the school calendar. We are tasked as educators, administrators, board members, all of us, to put our personal opinions aside and look at what is best for our students. We know the academics are not where we want them to be. Please keep our students and their needs as your priorities when you discuss and vote on this. <clears throat> Next, educators continue to struggle with workload issues. Again, I ask that you are mindful of what is absolutely essential and what can be done at another time. Our focus must be on instruction, and we can't do that as effectively as we need to as we are doing numerous other tasks that don't directly help our students. Administrators, please work with your educator councils so we can concentrate on what our students need and not the minutia that takes our time from our students. Finally, now that Election Day is over and most races are largely decided, I want to congratulate the winners and thank everyone who ran for the Board of Education. We know there is much to be done for our students and our educators, and I look forward to working with the new board. My goal remains the same no matter who is on this board, to recruit and retain educators so we can work to meet the needs of our students. This continues to be a challenge. Yes, a national challenge and a local one too, but we must do better as a system because our students deserve nothing less. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lisa Dingle with BCA BSE. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Board Chair Hinn, Board Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. S Superintendent Dr. Williams, and Board members. My name is Lisa Dingle, President of the Baltimore County Alliance of Black School Educators, fondly known as BCAPSI. 
I have had the opportunity to proudly serve BCPS for 31 years in several capacities, including elementary classroom teacher, assistant principal, principal, and currently as the coordinator for early childhood programs. Our members include teachers, front office staff, administrators, paraeducators, building service staff, retired staff, and parents. But BCAPSI has been partnering with BCPS for over 25 years, and we're in the process of reviving, revitalizing the organization. The purpose of BCAPSI is to promote and facilitate the education of all students with a particular focus on African American students, establish a coalition of African American educators, administrators, and other professionals directly and indirectly involved in the educational process, create a forum for the exchange of ideas and strategies to improve opportunities for African American educators and students, and identify and develop African American professionals who will assume leadership positions in education and influence public policy concerning the education of African Americans. Our organization is part of the National Alliance of Black School Educators. We have been charged to focus on national programming priorities which include improvement of student achievement, leadership development and career advancement, educator recognition, and legislative involvement and advocacy. According to the Baltimore County Public School website, 66.5% of our children are considered students of color. Additionally, BCPS students represent 138 countries and 147 languages. As the SNCC organizer Charles Cobb once said, education should enable children to possess their own lives instead of living at the mercy of others. And as Aristotle recognized, the roots of education are bitter, but the fruit is sweet. The process of teaching and learning is hard work, and it requires community involvement as it yields dividends far beyond what we see in the schoolhouse. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for your support while we rebuild our organization. The members of BCAPSI are here in the spirit of support, partnership, and innovation. Working collaboratively with the Board of Education and carrying out the vision as outlined in the compass, we can provide a world-class education for all students. Thank you, and have a good evening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Samantha Werfel with BCSC. And good evening, members of the Board of Education. It's so good to see you all again for another year. My name is Samantha Warfell, and I am serving as the president of the Baltimore County Student Councils. I'm here to give you some updates, and I plan to continue to do so for the rest of this year. So to begin, the beginning of this student council year has looked quite different for us. As you all are aware, BCSC, BCPS, and the community, community at large lost an advisor, colleague, and above all, a friend. Miss Nora Murray, just like she had done for many, changed my life. At my first meeting as a BCSC officer, she handed all of us a book titled Start With Why, How Great Leaders Inspire Others to Take Action. I took comfort in reading this book over again, and I realized that I found even more profound joy in realizing that the great leader described in the book could have un been an undoubted description of Miss Murray herself. She guided us through exciting initiatives and offered her unwavering support in the face of personal setbacks and hardships all the same, always checking in on students when she knew things were stressful and providing light in times of darkness. She hardly said no to us. Instead, she asked us about our plans of action and she challenged us to be the best versions of ourselves. While we are just beginning a year of student advocacy and community building with our first executive board meeting happening next Wednesday, and Board of Selected Students applications achieving record submission with all secondary schools but five uh, represented in the application process. And our five committees assembled and ready to get to work. We will honor Ms. Murray's legacy in every corner of this work by prioritizing our why, the empowerment of the student voice and the encouragement of community building. Additionally, on behalf of the BCSC officer team, I would like to extend immense gratitude to Ms. Stacy Wade for her guidance and advising us so far this year. We could not be doing what we are doing if not for her optimism, compassion, and unrelenting dedication to students. I again thank you for your time this evening, and I look forward to sitting before you in the months to come for another great year. 
Thank you. Thank you. Next is general public comment, and our first speaker is Latanya Lynn Lawings. Welcome. Good evening, Chairperson Hen, Vice Chair McMillan, Superintendent Dr. Williams. My name is Latanya Lynn Lawings, and I'm the president of the Baltimore County Chapter of the Continental Societies, Inc. The Baltimore County Chapter is a new chapter of the Eastern Region inducted into the society in 2020. We have 33 members, which include some retired and current educators. The mission of the Baltimore County Continental Society, Inc. is to serve and create environments within our communities that empower children to have access to the quality and appropriate programming to reach their optimal potential. This is done through providing programs in the following areas, health, education, employment, recreation, and arts and humanities. In addition, we also provide yearly scholarships to high school seniors. We have continued to partner with Edmondson Heights Elementary, Headville Elementary, Featherbed Lane Elementary, Dogwood Elementary, and Windsor Mill Middle School. We are looking forward to expanding our partnerships and programming to even more Baltimore County schools. We recognize that teaching and leading are hard work and cannot be done alone. It takes a village to raise a child. In our partnership, we have supported over 1,500 plus students by providing school supplies, which we will be delivering on November the 14th to Headville and Windsor Mill Middle School, 930. We have 33 members will be bringing in the um, products, school supplies. Participating in a virtual library, which school students can log in and listen to Continentals read stories by African American authors. The Continentals were even dressed as characters in their book. Participate in the African American Read-In, which Baltimore County Continentals reads to students. We donate culturally diverse books to the Baltimore County School Libraries, and we look forward to helping Baltimore County families enjoy Thanksgiving by providing food to those in need this year. We appreciate Dr. Williams, the support of the Baltimore County Chapter Continentals as we work together to carry out the vision of the school system. Thank you, and have a great evening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Danielle Smith. Good evening. Ooh. Good evening, everyone. First of all, let me start off by saying good evening, Dr. Williams, Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillan, and all of the school board members. Thank you for all that you do and the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Danielle Winky Smith. I am an advocate and community organizer, and I am here not only as a community leader who has and is currently serving on several organizations boards, committees, and this at the state and local level. But I am a concerned parent, grandparent, auntie, and a Baltimore County resident regarding, a Baltimore County resident regarding, con with concern with the current situation of students and our babies who are not only our future, but our now prospective leaders. I have an ask, and I want us to strongly consider it because the foundational needs of our kids need to be met immediately. I am here to request a call to action. This is a call to action for Baltimore County School System to engage community organizations and connect with social support systems to leverage a, to leverage a village approach to support our children and students. This will require financial resources, human capital for coordination, and dedicated educators and parents to see this through. We need to optimize education. 
The benefits of partnerships and collaborations is that it saves time, money, and preparation. For example, there, is existing, there are existing programs in place that could fulfill an aforementioned objectives to include the Divine Nine, which are sororities and fraternities, the Positive Change Foundation, Black Girls Vote, the 100 Coalition of Women, and local churches. We need to take more time to listen to the issues and concerns of our students and not just talk to them. In most cases, our students just want structure and understanding from all of us. Our professional um, therapists are overwhelmed as well as the parents. We are all aware of the inequities that existed prior to COVID-19 and the fact that they have exacerbated over the past three years. Our babies are suffering mentally, emotionally, and physically, and this calls for an all-hands-on-deck approach to some common-sense solutions. I am pro proposing a going-back-to-basics approach for it takes a village to save our children, which brings us full circle to the call to action. There are many eager collaborators, and I have spoken with a few of them, who are poised to provide the support that we need. The infrastructure already exists. We just need to create the connections and support of the collaborations. There is a desire for this with the parents as well. Again, my charge is that the organizations will work together in unity alongside the Baltimore County school system to ensure that all of our students are prepared academically, emotionally, and physically to be productive citizens. Thank, Thank you all for giving me that time to speak. <laughs> Thank you. Our next speaker is Erica Ma. Good evening. First of all, congratulations to the returning members of the Board of Ed, and welcome and congratulations to the new members. In particular, uh, Robin Harvey, who will be representing District 1, which is where my children go to school and where I also teach. Thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. Um, I was here in March and then sent a follow-up email about paperwork concerns uh, with survey results with over 400 teacher responses. That was last year, more than half a year ago. But two weeks ago, when I asked teachers again what their concerns were, the responses remained the same. Human resources, payroll, and certification. We've been told to be patient. We have been told and truly believe that these departments are overworked and understaffed. And recently, we were told that there are only three folks in the payroll department. Three, for all of BCPS. Reimbursements lag months behind, sometimes more than half a year. But those bills certainly don't have the same delay. They come due regardless. Folks have waited over a year for lane changes and even longer for that retro pay to show up. And then the messed up taxes come into play. And that's when folks actually get information about their growth charts, certifications, and salary changes. Many people get nothing but crickets and incorrect paychecks, which is better than some others. We have new teachers not paid for eight weeks into school. Eight weeks. Eight weeks they essentially worked for free. And then they had to fight to even get that pay. And when we can get subs, which is no guarantee because this Kelly system is not much better than the old one, they are not being paid on time or fully. Subs have quit because, shockingly, they can't work without pay. And I doubt they are coming back. We are a career of majority women. We have babies. Yet it's taking weeks for newborns to get onto insurance. Staff are trying to take care of family members and cannot get straight answers about whether or not leave has been approved. Mistakes are human and forgivable, but the amount of time it takes to respond is not, especially when health care is in jeopardy. But these delays are bad enough. What is completely unfathomable is that de dependents are being magically dropped from coverage, sometimes days before critical medical care. Is this our version of the dog ate my homework? But in BCPS, it's not the dog. It's still ransomware, really. It's been two years. How is this still the excuse? Can you imagine if a teacher said they couldn't do their observation or SLO or teach because their data was lost two years ago? That would not be acceptable. It is not easy working in these departments. This is in no way a reflection of those individuals working their tails off in these offices. We can recognize the needs for all hands on deck to staff classrooms, so we are using substitutes, interns, and conditional teachers. But we are losing the same staff when they don't get paid. We are end up in the same perpetual game of catch-up. Where's the all hands on deck for HR, payroll, and certification? 
Why has BCPS not been spending first marking period training other staff or temporary employees? This is not acceptable in March last year, and it is still not acceptable now. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michelle Smith. Michelle Smith. Not here. Michelle Smith. Not here. Okay. Heather Sferlaza. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, good evening, board members. Thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Heather Sferlaza. I am a BCPS kindergarten teacher and a parent of two BCS, BCPS students, and I'm tired. My work to support my students, to provide meaningful lessons, and to stay engaged with their families is never ending. There's simply not enough time in my workday to teach lessons, assess students, reflect on data, and plan for upcoming lessons. Through our union negotiations, our weekly planning time was increased. But are we all truly receiving this necessary time to complete our jobs? When a professional development day is planned, our workload increases. We fall further behind due to the numerous meetings, redundant safe schools trainings, and frivolous requirements like teacher development plans. We desperately need this time to catch up on the essential purpose of our job, to ensure that our students succeed. Instead, we are micromanaged and required to sign up for a minimum of five hours of professional development sessions. Teachers are professionals. We should be treated as such. As we work tirelessly to support our students, who is supporting us teachers? Our human resources department is unresponsive. Teachers are continuing to wait on assistance with payroll issues, certification, and insurance coverage being dropped. Teachers are required to respond to our students, families, and administrators. Our BCPS offices should be held to the same standard and respond to these issues in a timely manner. Instead, our various BCPS offices continue to push out new information and initiatives. Performance Matters has made teachers' jobs more difficult and parents cannot access the information. The elementary curriculum pilot has not been receiving positive feedback, but we're still being told that we're adopting the curriculum. And now we have the additional stress of changes to American Education Week coming at us. So again, who is supporting us as teachers? The district has had virtual town halls to address safety concerns, and our middle and high schools now have safety assistance. But we continue to have weapons and violence in our schools. What actions are being taken? When should we see results? As a teacher, I'm told I need a goal and a plan. What are your actionable steps? Where is the proof? Where is the data? Where is the transparency? Uh, the violence and safety concerns do not just affect these students directly involved. This is causing additional educator trauma. I'd like to know who is supporting the teachers. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Bosch Ferron. Dr. Ferron. Good evening. Thank you for what you do. Congratulations for the new elected board members. Just a reminder, the reason that we have too many non-coma religious holidays because the school system closed on one minority religion for almost 25 years, excluding all other minorities. Reminder that the Board of Education for the past five years has committed itself for equal holidays, equal, I interpreted two equals two, one equals one, zero equals zero. I really wish that you would uphold that principle when you discuss the calendar tonight. Ms. Mary Taylor has created the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition. Amy Adams is the chair or president. This coalition, I notice, has 5,000 members. Compare that 
that their leaders come in almost every board of education, three or four of them, speak to you. Compare that with the education advisory councils led by Ms. Donna Sibley. We have about 50 members in those five councils. You rarely see any of them, except for my colleague Marlena from Southwest. I think this system is a failure, waste of taxpayer money, and requires your attention. Number three, I did send an email alerting you that one Baltimore County policeman has misconduct in relation to me, and I have not really seen any official response yet. I also sent to you in December of last year my complaint that someone is committing violations of policy 1230. We met in January, and then after that, I have not seen any official response. All what I am asking is for the due process to be executed. It's already one year, almost one year. I do pay taxes, and I do take offense that the central area has conducted fake elections. If we allow fake elections in any of our portions, that gives a strong message to the students. It would not really be a good message. I ask the Board of Education to act on it. And Madam Chairwoman, it's really not fair to leave it for the next chair. I ask you, please, to act on it one way or the other. Thank you. Our next speaker is Darren Badillo. Good evening, board. At the last Board of Education meeting, um, the board you guys had mentioned that you're going to make violence a top priority and continue the conversation. Uh, my question is, uh, what changes have been made? Um, also, I'm grateful that the president of the teachers union agreed that some schools are okay, but there are some schools that need additional resources. Uh, my question is, where are those resources? What options do those schools have? When will something new be implemented? And I want to apologize. Um, at the last meeting, I made an error um, about an incident that happened in school. Um, so I apologize about that. A 14-year-old child did not get killed on Baltimore County schools grounds. It was 0.5 miles away from the school after a football game. But since the beginning of the year, um, I documented over 38 incidents of violence at 22 different schools, seven elementary schools, five middle schools, and 10 high schools. Here are a few incidents that happened since our last board meeting two weeks ago. Um, a 14-year-old student had a handgun found in their book bag at Parkville High School. Um, at Hereford High School, we saw a fight in a, in, a, um, in a cafeteria lasting a minute and a half where it was ending where another student was choking another student and had to be broken up by students. Um, on the 7th, we had six fights in one day at Parkville Middle School. Board, us parents are fed up and we're demanding you take action now. Here's a letter that was sent to me by a Baltimore County substitute teacher. I was at one high school subbing in, and I was shocked at the amount of cussing aloud. I addressed the issue to the principal and was, tur tur I was told to turn my ears off. I was also, I was given a list of offenses students can do that the principal does not want the teachers to address with him. For those offenses, the teachers should change their techniques, offer emotional support, call home, or have talks with the students. Examples, leaving school, leaving class, language, dress code, cell phone use, the list was long. A reason to contact the principal, if somebody fought, um, was doing drugs, or leaving school more than 10 times. 
The students leave class when they want. They walk around and hide in quarters of the school. They consistently cuss on their phones and ignore direction. There's zero dress code. To teach the students that want to learn, the teachers have to talk over the, talk over the students. The staff response is there's nothing that we can do about it because it's the administrators that allow it. As a mother, I worry for kids who want to learn but are focused, on, focused to tolerate the environment. They are being denied their education, so the majority of the students can have no, ex no expectations set upon them. I feel sad for the disruptive students because they are learning that no one expects anything from them. Not only are they losing out on learning, but the school is reinforcing that those students aren't worth the time. Without expectations, we are setting them up for failure. When I ask my children how they learn in these types of environments, they say we turn our brains off. BCPS is teaching children who want to better themselves that they want their wants are invalid. Dr. Williams, you said this is down 11 percent. That's a lie. You need to take that back, sir. Our next speaker is Lloyd Lloyd Allen. Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board, thank you for your time. I am Lloyd Allen, he, him, special educator in mathematics, speaking as an individual. My topic is system staffing, but I'm going to need a minute to get there. Farid Udin Attar was a Persian poet 900 solar years ago and is well known for his epic poem, The Conference of the Birds. The specific vocabulary that we need to preview, two of the very few words of Persian that I know, are that murg means bird, and C means 30. The Conference of the Birds has a frame story and many, many short poems interwoven. It begins with all the words, bur all the world's birds, for our purposes, let's count them at 14,520. The chair of this committee of birds is the hoopoe. The hoopoe leads the birds on his search for the great and magical Seamurg, a giant and wise bird whom the other birds seek as a ruler. The birds engage in dialogue with the hoopo and fall off the search individually with excuses and in large swaths as they go through various valleys of tribulation and despair. When the final council of birds makes it through the last valley, they see a still lake below them. Looking down, the 30 birds see the sea merg, see the sea merg looking up at them in their reflection. They had had the ruby slippers the whole time. It turned out that they had been seeking their own selves. Board, I believe that we as a system can find 30 birds within ourselves for many tasks that we outsource. It's fine to go to textbooks and other sources for banks of problems, but we need to leverage the strengths of the size of our system and recognize that we already employ masters of content and pedagogy. One of my fondest memories of working within the system was participating in the writing of the geometry curriculum. Math resource teacher Nina Riggs served as our hoopo, and we worked as a pair of teachers for each unit. Most units were written by an early career educator, ECE, paired with a veteran teacher. In most cases, the ECE had fresher training and were more knowledgeable about new resources, new websites, new tools. The veteran teacher tended to have an idea of what would actually fly in a classroom, as well as an understanding of what knowledge students had going into the course, as well as what skills they would need for the following course. When we write our own curriculum, if there are problems, we can responsively adapt quickly. If there were a typo, a formatting mistake, a mathematical error, or a lesson that just didn't work, there was a mechanism for that feedback to be acted on. When we outsource our curriculum, we do not have that ability. When we outsource any of our staff, subs, contractors, we do not directly oversee them. They are not ours. Anything that is our core mission, we need to own. And we need to appropriately support the staff involved so that they can be successful. They need to be sufficient both in number and in resources. Thank you. Thank you. Before we continue, I remind everyone that inappropriate, disparaging personal remarks are out of order. You will not be permitted to continue speaking um, if you can remain out of order during your remarks. Thank you. Our next speaker is um, Sharon Saroff. Forgive me for not taking my mask off. I just got over COVID. Wasn't even sure I was gonna be here tonight. I wanna to speak tonight about accountability, 
something that was discussed at the CCAC meeting on Monday, uh, something that uh, Dr. Williams said was something he was very interested in. And I appreciate hearing that. I'm gonna give you a definition of accountability, what it is and what it isn't. Accountability in special education means that we're implementing the, edu the individualized education plan. Notice that the first letter in IEP is individualized. That means one size does not fit all. That's, and one size fits all is the way Baltimore County does special ed. When we write IEPs, we are trying to address the needs of our students, not address what the school can provide. In other words, if you don't have a speech and language therapist at the school, you look to get one or you look to find ways to make sure that that child is still getting their services with a qualified individual. You need to make sure that transportation is available to these students. Some of these kids need door to door and should not have to walk down to the corner when, when their house is a block away or two blocks or a mile from the bus stop in order to get to school. Or should not have to not have a bus at all because the bus doesn't come. A student should not have to wait two months or over a year for a placement. And that includes a non-public placement. Some of our students do need non-public placements. And I know they're expensive. The list goes on. I would like to direct Dr. Williams and the board to look at certain individuals in certain schools who are doing an exceptional job. Ms. Leto, Catherine Singer, Megan Shields, That's... and Lindsay Newson. Thank they you. Deserve our recognition. Thank you, Ms. Harroff. Be the example of what we should do. Thank you. And Ms. Harroff was our final speaker for general public comment. Our next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. And for that, I call on Dr. Williams. Good evening, once again, uh, Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, and members of the board. I am pleased to present my superintendent's report to the board and team BCPS. <laughs> My report includes celebrations, updates, evidence of our strategic plan, the compass, our pathway to excellence in action. I'll continue. So please join us as we proudly celebrate National School Psychologist Week, which is November 7th through 11th, to highlight the invaluable work of our school psychologists. Our BCPS blog features the work of outstanding members of Team BCPS. They are representative of the incredible work that goes on each 
of our schools to ensure students thrive. Many thanks to our psychologists for supporting students and families. Your expertise, ability to remove barriers, and compassion are appreciated. The sixth annual Baltimore County Public Schools HBCU College Fair will be held on Saturday, December 10th. This is a wonderful opportunity for students to explore post-secondary options and receive on-the-spot admissions. BCPS staff who are graduates of historically black colleges and universities or members of the Panhellenic Council are sought as volunteers to assist with the fair. So we ask that all volunteers sign up by November 25th. American Education Week begins on November 14th. Festivities honor the team of people who work in our nation's public schools, everyone from the bus driver and classroom teacher to the cafeteria worker and administrative staff, plus countless others. For the first time since 2019, we invite our families to visit our schools to experience firsthand the rich learning environments our students enjoy. All right. The show must go on. Thank you. Next slide, please. Math Homework Helpers Live is back on November 2nd. The program debuted. Elementary students were encouraged to call in or submit questions via YouTube chat for live on-air help with their math questions. In addition to the live sessions, tape math homework helpers shorts can be viewed on Schoology, YouTube, VMO, and on BCPS TV channels, Verizon 34 or Comcast 73. The shorts are math lessons aligned with the elementary math curriculum. We know that our efforts to heal, rebuild, and recover must be ongoing. Next slide. We will continue to move forward to meet the needs of Team BCPS. That's why we have a renewed focus on academic achievement and partnerships in BCPS. We know that we can't do this work alone. We are grateful for a community that remains engaged and committed to the success of all students. Next slide. Recognizing the impact of the last non-traditional school years, we have refocused our efforts on improving teaching and learning for all students, addressing school climate needs so that students and staff feel physically and socially emotionally safe and welcome, prioritizing equitable allocation of time, resources, and attention based on student needs, collaborating across schools and offices with internal and external stakeholders to ensure team success and developing effective structures, structures and processes to stay focused on teaching and learning. Our commitment is to mutual accountability, monitoring for consistency of implementation, and creating ongoing opportunities for feedback from a variety of stakeholders as we strive to address the considerable needs of Team BCPS and engage in continuous improvement. Next slide. On October 25th, I shared with Team BCPS the importance of ensuring safe and supportive environments for all students. In that message, we detailed our considerable investment in safe schools and echoed the calls of parents and students alike to take urgent action. While our efforts indicate progress, we know it is not enough until every single student feels protected and heard. Upcoming efforts to continue this work include continued direct support to schools and the development of a safe and supportive environments advisory group comprised of BCPS staff and external stakeholders. The goal is to provide transparency on school incidents in BCPS response and to promote continuous improvement through data analysis and multi-stakeholder dialogue. The invitations have gone out and we have already received commitments from our stakeholders who are eager to begin work. This advisory group will be tasked with reviewing data, providing feedback, and making recommendations. Our next community conversations on safe and supportive environments will focus on middle schools. Participants will hear from the Maryland Safe Schools expert psychologists on normative adolescent behaviors, and we will discuss opportunities to build positive partnerships and provide student support in middle schools. 
We are focusing on middle schools because our data shows that this is an area of intense needs. Coming soon, BCPS will debut quarterly school safety snapshots. This front-facing data report will provide school-specific positive behavior plans, specific programs, resources, and discipline data. Next slide. The best indicator of student success in the classroom is highly skilled educators. For that reason, we have worked across offices and divisions to collaborate and create a robust plan for professional learning that meets the needs of all members of Team BCPS. So this slide, as detailed as it may read, many of the training opportunities have been delivered this quarter, which focus on improved teaching and learning. Next slide. We know that learning is our core purpose and equity is our work. Equitable access and opportunities are critical factors in raising the bar and closing gaps. We are committed to the success of every student in every school. As Team BCPS, we must interrupt inequitable practices and implement systemic initiatives, strategies, and key actions to increase student achievement for all students while decreasing, decreasing gaps which exist for historically marginalized student groups. To that end, during the first quarter, we have engaged in the following work across the system. Train central office leaders, executive directors, and principals focus on policy, board policy 100, 200, and 300. Work with all schools to create individual school progress plans that identify specific areas of need in literacy, mathematics, and climate for all student groups. Every school has identified the professional learning required to help support increased student success. Sent school-based equity liaisons to the Maryland Cultural Proficiency Conference in preparation for school-based plan implementation and trained all teachers on de-escalation strategies on October 24th to provide additional tools and ensure consistency across schools. This quarter, we will begin school cluster equity PLCs, or professional learning communities, focus on the examination of student performance data in mathematics, improve access to higher level courses, and increasing the needs of students who demonstrate college and career readiness. Last slide. We continue to update, we will continue to update the board and community and team BCPS during these exciting times. I do want to thank our community for coming out and providing feedback. I do take issue being called a liar, and I wish our students and communities understand that is not how we do business. We are professional. We will speak accordingly and appropriately. I thank Chair Hinn for addressing that. Those behaviors will not be accepted in this room, in our schools, in our school buildings. So for those who want to call me a liar, I want to see you in our school buildings. I want to see you involved in education and not just running your mouth. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. The next item on the agenda is the chair's report. I want to congratulate the newest school board members on their election to the board. Um, election Day 2018 was one of the proudest, I could say before this election day, was one of the proudest moments in my life. I was elected to represent, for one, the school that I attended as a child. Um, my mom got to actually vote for me at that school. And believe it or not, she voted for me again. So thank you, Mom. I, I need to thank her. And she would say, um, you loved Harford Hills. I'll, I'll call them out. And that's the school that made me. And it's why I'm here today. And it's something I've never forgotten. I've never forgotten the people in that building who gave to me something that is priceless. And if I had one lesson to share with this board, and I'm, I'm not going to let them forget it, it's to take care of the people in our schools. They are the ones taking care of our children. They took care of me. I can tell you their names. I'm not going to waste your time, but I know their names. And I can tell you a million memories of exactly why they are so special. And I know that everyone sitting here who's gone through our schools has the same stories 
and the same love to share for those in our buildings. And to those in our schools, you will not realize, you may not ever realize the impact that you will make on the students that you encounter and take care of every single day. But let me tell you, it's real. I'm sitting here now because of many of you that took care of me, and that is our number one job. Because you take care of our kids, it's our job to take care of you. And that's our only job. And what I am most proud of, and I'm even proud of this election day, is of this board for prioritizing our people in our schools, our positions, their compensation, taking care of them. And yes, we need to do better. We absolutely need to do better, but we have acknowledged that. Dr. Williams and his team are working so hard, tirelessly, to do better. We have heard so many tonight. We hear you. And I'm proud of this board for making that a priority. Because until we do right by you, we cannot do right by kids. And that's the only reason we are here. So with that said, congratulations to our board members. You have big um, footprints to fill. And we will be holding you, you accountable, Very, Vice Chair McMillian and I, for sure. Um, but welcome. Congratulations again. And to my colleagues on the board, thank you. Thank you for your service this term. Could never have gone, no one could have foreseen how this term would have gone for any of us. We survived, we all survived the system um, together, and we will move forward together as long as we take care of our school staff, our families, and, and they will take care of our kids. So, with that said, thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the student board member's report. And for that, I call on Mrs. Hassan. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here once again with all of you speaking on behalf of the students. I'd like to once again take a moment to thank those in the audience, on the dais, our teachers, parents, staff, and most importantly, our students, for their contributions to our education system. You all remind us of why we are here and why we serve. I want to begin by acknowledging yesterday's elections and thank everyone who showed up to vote. I especially want to thank our young people, some of whom voted for the very first time yesterday, for their civic engagement and their action. Regardless of what your ballot looked like, thank you for showing up and voting. I want to congratulate those who ran, as well as those who have won their respective elections to this Board of Education. I look forward to working with each of you and sharing a love for students and service. It is an incredibly unique situation to say a bittersweet goodbye to outgoing board members and welcome new ones, but I am grateful to remain on this dais and live by my purpose and commitment to our school system. So thank you to each of you on the dais for your immense and outstanding service. Our purpose and my purpose as a system must always be to prepare the next generation of leaders, of citizens, and most importantly, members of our community. We teach youth so that they can lead us into the future, and that is why we are here. That is why I emphasize the importance of youth voice, not only because it is power, but it is our present and our future. It is the young people who stood in line, the young people who phone banked, the young people who volunteered and reminded their family members to vote, as well as the young people who do not yet have the education to actively participate, who make up our democracy and the fate of our future. So thank you to our youth for voting and shattering glass ceilings once again. Today I ask us to keep civic education at the top of our minds and at the center of our education systems. As we teach students how to read, we also teach them how to think critically, to question everything, to pursue research, and most importantly, to never stop learning. The curiosity we foster, the education we push for, will create our future. It will never be our place to tell students how to think, but it will be our place to encourage their growth, provide them access to knowledge, and hear their voices as they choose to become civically engaged. My reports will always be about student voice, but it is also about the impact of cultivating that voice, about guaranteeing that our students feel safe sharing their concerns as loudly as possible so long as they do so in a safe environment and one that fosters growth. 
Our students have every right to speak, and I look forward to welcoming students to this room in every room they choose to speak in. Our role must always be not only to guarantee education, but education that is applicable to our global society and to our respective communities. I was recently asked what it meant to be educated, and I found myself rereading what I had responded. Knowledge is power, yet education is liberation. To be educated is a practice. It is seeking knowledge and choosing to transform it into freedom. The pursuit of education must always be active, as one changes the status quo only through persistence. It is meant to be the most delightful struggle, because education is in our human nature, as it is to err, criticize, and evolve. Without evolution and structure, we find ourselves in a society of complacency. To be educated is to directly challenge that. It is to find love and truth and still continue to challenge it, to build upon it, and to gift education to others. I truly hope we continue to provide that gift to every student who walks into our school system. And I look forward to bringing our students to the table. And as always, I look forward to causing good trouble. Thank you all. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session. And for that, I call on Mr. Mercedes. Thank you, Mr. Mercedes. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on hearing examiner's case HE23-12 and authorize Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not physically present? So moved, Hager. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Hassan. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Tulesky? Yes. Ms. Jose? Abstain. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Abstain. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Abstain. Ms. Hen? Yes. Favor is seven. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Mercedes. The next item on the agenda is contract awards, and for that I call on Ms. Joes, Chair of the Building and Contracts Committee. Good, e oh, good. Sorry, good evening. <sighs> okay, where's my script? Members of the board, the board's building and contracts committee met on Monday. November 7, 2022, items K1 is being pulled out at the request of staff. Item K2 through K10 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Do I have a motion to approve items K2 through K10? So move Stileski. Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Any discussion? Madam uh, Chair, Dr. this is Ms. Causey. Excuse I me, Mrs. Causey, Dr. Hager, and then I'll call to you. Certainly, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Good. Um, I have a question about number six, which is um, information technology staffing services. Sure. Um, it's just a very large increase, $3.4 million. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the uh, budget s sessions that we sit down and have lengthy discussions about, you know, $1 million increases and things like that. And so to, to increase staffing by $3.4 million in a mid-year contract, I just would like to know a little bit more about that. Sure, Mr. Augusto is here to uh, to discuss that uh, contract. Yes, yeah, so the three point four million dollar request is the annual request that we do. So this is a six year contract um, with a net uh, contract amount, I think, of twenty some odd million. And um, at the initial onset of that contract, it was requested that we come back on an annual basis to request the spending authority increase. Now, if you look at um, the spending authority versus the actuals, we've actually been under 
the amount. So we have been good financial stewards of only using um, the contract resources for projects and for other IT initiatives or um, reporting initiatives through DRAW. So we have been monitoring and only using this particular contract when necessary. So, so if um, we've been underspending, then why are we increasing the amount? Maybe I'm not uh, understanding. No, because it has to be, this is for the fiscal year. So we, every fiscal year we come and ask for the spending authority for that fiscal year. Okay, so this year we're really increasing it by $1.2 million, because last year it was $2.2 million, or $2.25. We're actually, we are ex, uh, increasing the spending authority by $3.4 million. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think I understand. Thank okay. you. Yes. So it's the same thing last year, $3.4 million, and of which uh, we did $2.2 million. Thank you. Anything further, Dr. Hager? Okay. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I had a couple quick things. <clears throat> One, I will need to recuse from item seven, uh, modification Pine Grove Middle School. Uh, second, in uh, dovetailing with previous question <clears throat> about the technology staffing services, <clears throat> excuse me, um, our we, we've heard multiple things about HR and benefits and uh, some of that, uh, those services and systems are not functioning optimally and they're causing problems for staff. Is any of this going to assist the HR? What exactly is, is the reason for such a, uh, a large amount? Well, the large amount is a, uh, um and correct me if I'm wrong, this is the flat line amount based on the years of the contract and the total contract amount. So 3.4 should equate to the, the um, equal portion per year for the, for the contract amount. Because the, the original contract amount was, um, for the spending authority was anticipated to be 22 or, Sorry, so it was um, 22 million. All right, so um, this is the authority to spend um, based on the uh, contract amount. Now, um, for every year up, uh, initially, um, when the contract was let out, I believe in 2018, 2019, there was a um, large portion of that um, allocation for the fiscal year was used to support the ransomware recovery. Uh, since then, that has ratcheted down, and uh, we are using the contract for on a DOIT side to provide project management resources, business analyst resources. It's also used by DRAW for data analytics resources above and beyond the uh, standard, or above and beyond the um, steady state FTEs. Thank you. So there are multiple vendors <clears throat> on this, and it would be helpful to, to receive the breakdown of where that spending authority is going to go and, and where um, it has already gone. So so there there is a request to provide the spend to date for this particular contract, which we will provide. But let me uh, clarify something on this. Uh, this is equivalent to a supply schedule. Um, this was pre-competed so that it would allow uh, BCPS, DOIT, and DRAW, and anyone else looking to use technology resources to very quickly get those resources on board without having to do a separate uh, procurement or separate purchase for for the particular need. So each of these vendors, and I believe there are 48 or so, um, these particular vendors gave us a listing of their labor categories, the services that they supported, and a rate. And then we issued POs um, out for bid, and people who are interested to bid will um, put in the bid on those 
labor categories and the rates. So um, it is something where we don't earmark amounts for every vendor on that list. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hartlove, I have a follow-up question on this. Sure. If it's not um, unduly burdensome for you and your team to provide the board with um, lifetime expenditures by vendor on contract requests where there are multiple vendors, that's a question that comes I've seen come up repeatedly. That would be incredibly helpful on the exhibits that the board receives. We can... That's certainly something we can look at. We did, I, I actually, before the meeting was over last night, uh, uh, Ms. Webster had put together the response to this particular contract. So we have the information for this that I believe we're going to be uh, providing to the board in the weekly update, I would imagine. Correct. Yes. Part particularly, I know it comes up on, on construction contracts, and I'll make right. a request through Dr. Williams, but that's something that comes up through Contracts Committee and also has been requested through Budget Committee. It'd be that, makes, that makes sense. It's certainly something we can we can try to build into Again, uh, future if it's not exhibits. Yes. Unduly burdensome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes, Ms. Jose. Thank you. Uh, my question is for um, contract MEW eight hundred two twenty three, the leasing warehouse space in Pulaski Highway, and I asked that yesterday. Um, I kind of did a quick math on the. Contract spending authority, and it's for seven years. It just seems excessively high for a, even if it was a fully fabricated warehouse. The the price real is, real property almost seems like it's prime property downtown. Uh, to me, that seems excess for storing. What are you storing? Equipment and paper and records. So. <clears throat> I'm not sure if I heard all of your question, so may I ask a you? A lot of comments in there. So I, was, I had just done a quick math on the, the square footage of the warehouse and based on the annual expenditure of seven years anticipated, it seemed ex a bit excessively high. I know real property prices are going up, but that seemed a bit excessive. So the expenditure is for seven years. Um, I can call by year if you want to. But on an, on an average, it's around 130 to 140,000 per year. With the first year, it's about 44,357 dollars. The money is already in the budget for the first year, and for the next year, it's included in our request. And this warehouse is only 9,700 square feet, correct? That's right. So I was doing that number divided by the number that you're spending a year time the seven years square footage and when you look at it comprehensively it seems a bit excessive so the cost um, for per square foot is eleven dollar ninety five cents and if you take uh, nine thousand seven hundred and some square feet and multiply that by approximately $12, you'll get that number. So again, you said that this warehouse was necessary to store equipment. And um, are you sto storing anything that's not needed, uh, records that are not needed to be kept, paper, just dead space, and things that could be disposed of? So as I shared with the committee in, the, in your committee meeting, uh, we are a growing school system. Our enrollment is increasing every every year, and we have an expanded capital program with a lot of construction going on. During the construction time and at the time of relocation to new school, we have to store a lot of equipment. We try to um, to to minimize the storage, but still there is an extensive amount of storage needed. The capital pr program includes a lot of large high schools requiring additional space. We have been looking for a space even for our existing needs. Uh, if you visit any of our warehouse, uh, we are bur bursting out of seam, and this thing is going to require more and more. In addition to that, there have been grant funds available, ESSA grant funds, and we have been buying a lot of items for that and totally running out of space. So this space is in the vicinity of our existing warehouse, 
which gives the added advantage of operational efficiency. So if, we, if we do not avail of this opportunity, we may have to go to other locations, which has consequences of additional staff and additional operation uh, uh, that will be required. Join with me is Ms. Liz Becker, who's the Director of Operations and Logistics. Uh, if you want to add anything to what I said, feel free to do that. Well, I just wanted to answer your question about the records that we don't need. Yes, we do have records that we don't need. We have a ban. And currently, because we can't bring a lot of these records in around, if you go around central office, they have boxes and boxes because of the destruction of records ban. So these, we are so full that we can't accept anymore. And that's why there's a lot of boxes around central office right now. So there is, there's boxes of records, but we can't do anything with it. And that's why we're asking for this space to at least give us an opportunity to be able to clean the system up and store what we really need to store for these schools. Because right now we're trying to a workaround and it's not working. So as soon as you get this space, you're going to fill it up and then you're going to need additional space because no. mm -hmm. more records the, coming that you need to no, store? No, this, this space will loosen up what we're having problems in the main warehouse to move. We would use the logistics warehouse as the main hub. The stuff that we have, like records and whatnot, that are really not moving, items that don't move as much, like it right now with health services, if they don't have a lot of masks going out, we would put that in that space where we're not going in it and is not as active, where we can use the logistics warehouse for more of an active warehouse, because that's where all the new school supplies, the curriculum comes in. Every single day we get close to eight to ten tractor trailers a day that come through that warehouse. And it's cross docked and we pull, we have 12 trucks that go out every single day delivering and picking up from schools. So there's a lot of activity. These, this warehouse is not a standstill warehouse. It is a very active warehouse. And this is in addition to the already existing warehouse we have. And do you know at the top of the head what we're paying for that warehouse? It's about the same. It's, it's about the same, yes. It's about the same. So $2 million, well, I guess it's over seven on, years. On, okay, when so I said about the same on per, per square foot basis. And it's the same company? Yes. Same company. All right, thank you. Thank you. Other questions, board members? Mrs. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, again, the question wasn't answered about uh, can any of JMI 61818 help our human resources and payroll issues? And if not, what is the plan for additional support for those important functions for our employees? I can, I can speak to the fact that we are working on those systems, and I believe, here comes Mr. Augusto here, I do believe that some of those folks are supporting um, the ERP system, which we're actively working on. Yes, so Ms. Causey, uh, to answer your question, yes, it can. Uh, because of the scope of that contract and the flexibility to, um, it's, it's based on the labor categories that the that the vendors have bid, we can use, we can definitely use that contract vehicle to bring in development staff, database staff, business analysts, and so forth. Okay, thank you. So that is part of the plan for this additional expenditure. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scott. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Uh, my question was also on the warehouse um my question is um is there any way that those records and all that can be converted to a web-based system that, that is a good i believe we've been working on that um it, it, it is on a department by department basis we have been working on on some digitization of of some of our of our records so yes we have uh worked real hard to place as much as possible on a digital mm -hmm. platform. Mm -hmm. However, I think 
the, the staff was trying to answer the question, but I'm going to go right in. Because of the ban, record retention ban, we have to maintain physically all these documents. If you recall, last year, two years ago, maybe, we reported to the board the status. And we had a tractor trailer, we had pictures. We have now come to the point where the staff is requesting additional space because of the record retention ban that is existing. We have gotten the approval of the archivists, we have the schedule, we have the documents, we have the form. So prior to my arrival in 2019, maybe it was at the beginning of 2019, there was a record retention ban that we could not destroy documents. So we have to put them in boxes and they are located in trailers to be stored. Since then, um, the team, Ms. Howie and her team, now Mr. Augusto and his team have worked. So I want to go back to, I believe, what Ms. Joes was saying or asking. No, thank you. This is going right to the, yeah. that was my question. You're it's answering right it exactly. Back to, we have now reached capacity. So in order to continue to do, open up new school buildings and new furniture, we have to look at additional places to store. Mm -hmm. But the bigger issue, and I think it's coming up to the board, or has come up to the board, about a recommendation about the record retention ban. So the record retention ban is causing us to, because of the board is doing a record retention ban, it's causing us to now have a, a, a million dollar contract for additional storage? Is that accurate? So I have a follow-up to this. I'm sorry, excuse me. I was yes, asking staff. I wasn't asking you. I would like for... You're directing but I would, your question Well, I, to. I know who I'm directing it to, so I'm asking staff. Dr. Williams, or unless you'd like a staff member to... Scott, this question was Excuse me. I'd like to hear that from the I'm, staff. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm... I'd like to hear it from the staff. Me. You don't work for BCPS. I, I'm asking the experts for Ms. their Scott. opinion. I have the contract here. I see the amount. Please don't interrupt me. Ms. I'm Scott, speaking. The question was addressed in committee by Ms. Becker, and okay. I'd like to ask Ms. I'm not, Becker... Well, she can answer. To Ms. Becker, are you Ms. Becker? She address. can answer. I'm not. Excuse me. No, I meant the lady behind you there. I am calling on yes. Ms. Becker to address so, your question. Because so because or Dr. Williams. I was, Williams yeah. I was asking Dr. Williams, though. I was asking Dr. Williams. Because Dr. the Williams. question was raised. Yeah, and, it's, and I asked you first, and then you the can staff, direct it to staff. It's appropriate for the staff to Thank answer. Thank you. I think Ms. Becker was going down that road a little bit, but I would ask her to provide a little bit more detail. Would you like me to repeat the question for you, or you got it? I got it. Thank you. We currently have over 20,000 square foot of records. Not all those records are required to be destroyed. They are archive records, and then we also have the records for destruction. There's a distinction. So even with the records ban, we're still gonna have about 80% of the records still required to sit at the warehouse. So just because we have, because we have such a large amount of records that are within the like central office that are in conference rooms in offices, that is where a lot of your records destruction are sitting right now because we cannot take them into the warehouse because cord forms have to be filled out and mm -hmm. it's got to be approved and right now that's not being approved by anyone. So, Got it. so right now it's just mostly archives and we cannot get rid of a lot of those records because of the schedule. Okay. And that's what I was asking this amount, dollar amount that we're looking at because of this retention that was put in by the board. Now we, you're, we're having to get a new contract for larger storage area because I, I can't remember, but a staff it's, member yeah, said it's, it's not overflowing. All, right. It's not all because of the records It's the system is growing so quickly. Mm -hmm that we, we are requiring additional space. Would you still need the space if there wasn't the record retention? Correct. Okay. You would still absolutely need the space. Absolutely. That's what my question yes, is. Absolutely. Would it be a million dollars worth of space? Yes, a million dollars is for seven years and seven months. Okay. So it's not for a one year contract. It's, it's, it's uh, running yeah, simultaneously. Yeah, it says seven years and yeah. seven months. I it's can read that. It's sim running yeah. simultaneously with the existing lease that's at Pulaski Park. Great. Thank you. You're and welcome. If I could add just sure. one Go thing. Ahead, so we're kind of, there's the, the space issue, which we need regardless of whether we have the records or not. But I think the other issue that got kind of brought up, and we don't mind kind of putting our little two cents in, the, if you just walk through, do a tour of our building, 
you'll see boxes sitting around, you'll see conference rooms filling up. Um, and that's, and, and certainly the, the, uh, the ban, w getting rid of the ban would help with that. It, it, it would, because we're, you, you know, there's some space that we're not able to use. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be great to be able to do that, not to save the, the, the warehouse cost, but just to free up space within central office. Okay, thank you. It's Causey. So, hold one, one second. I just want to mention, um, Ms. Scott, because you did ask about digitization, mm -hmm. about creating. So, we are working on um, digitization of documents. So, that is um, an effort initiative that we're doing. Thank you for following up on that. And my apologies, Dr. Hager was next. Dr. Hager? Um, yeah, sorry, bumping back to number six again. Okay. <laughs> I just keep hopping back and forth. Um, so this uh, this contract is for contractual services, but the department itself has staff. That's correct. So what are the services that we can't handle on our own within our own infrastructure that we need to contract right. out? So it's, it's, um, so it's not necessarily that we can't. So what we're using this um, contract vehicle for is to augment our existing staff. So um, in particular cases where we have a project that's that started up and we need surge support um, for a short period of time or a period of time, it makes sense to use contractual resources for that because you don't need them post um, implementation. Uh, we also use this in case there's a specific skill set. So if we're looking to augment, say, a database analyst or a database analyst, uh, draw would, would use that. We would use that as well. We have a limited amount of resources. We want to do bring in a DBA resource for a period of time. We'll use that. And, and I, I, I mean, that to me makes sense. That's how most contractual services are used, but $3.4 million is a lot. So is there any attempt to to bring on folks who have those skill sets so that we don't need a contract this big in the future? Yes, so uh, what we're looking at, and I'll give you an example for my um, division. Um, I'm looking at um, resources to support ERP systems um, and additional work coming through that particular area. So for the um, support of steady state systems where I'm going to need somebody for multiple years, I put in requests for, for FTEs for that. I will still continue leveraging a contract vehicle like this for surge and staff augmentation. Thank you, Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate uh, all the comments about um, record retention. Uh, it was quite a <clears throat> uh, widely reported a uh, serious situation where there were uh, documents that were uh, destroyed and uh, in any case it also resulted in an iMERGE consulting uh, report. So I would request the superintendent to uh, provide to the board an update on the implementation of the iMERGE, the uh, current standing of implementation of policy 2380. <laughs> related to uh, document. Thank uh, you. That's time, Mrs. Causey. Thank you. I would ask if you have follow up, further requests, you follow up with an email, and I'd be happy to facilitate those. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion board members? Hearing none, Ms. Hitt, I, I just I just want to make a comment. Go ahead, Dr. Williams. Um, <clears throat> I want to go back to um, item six that what we're trying to do is expand the technology services. The staff can't do it by themselves, so we have to look at, they have current work, and then we're trying to fix some things that may not be working. So we need the contracted services. Uh, I recognize the concern about the expense, but in terms of what we've been trying to do is we can't continue to pile on the staff to do current work and new work. So I just want to share that. And then I want to go back to, <laughs> dangerously go back to number nine, is simply saying we are appreciative of the work in our capital budget and how we are improving schools and refurbishing um, furniture. We're running out of space. We're running out of space. I think that's what the staff is saying. However, board, this is your opportunity 
Um, I heard what Miss the request from Miss Causey. I think this is a conversation that this board needs to have about the current ban, record retention ban that we have had on the system um, since my arrival. Again, I want to echo it's 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 just a piece of the issue, but we're running out of space anyway. But I think that's something that the this current board needs to reflect on and make a decision that is it worth to continue this ban, this record retention ban, based on something that happened in 2018, 2019. And again, a little lessons learned. The staff worked really hard to get a schedule, um, but I just want to put that forth before I follow up with I merge or anything else. I think the board needs to have that discussion. Thank you, Ms. Thank Hay. you. May I have a roll call vote, Ms. Gover? Madam Chair, I ask yes. to separate item yes, five. Yes, it's been noted, Ms. Causey. Thank you. Item seven, item seven correct? Five and seven? Oh, you want to separate item five. Okay. Um, who made the motion for this one? Was it Ms. Tulowski? Yes, I believe so. Um, would you mind withdrawing your motion as we need to separate? Sure, item? I will withdraw the motion. Thank you. Um, and I will introduce a new motion. Then do I have a motion to approve items K2 through K4 and items K6 through K10? So move Stolowski. No seconds needed. Um, may I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes, but I'm recusing from seven. Ms. Jaleski? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. Do I have a motion to approve item K5? So moves Stolowski. No second is needed. May I have a roll call vote? Madam Chair, I had a question in the chat. Yes, Mrs. Causey. Uh, thank you. Um, I was not aware of uh, tax council services that the board has utilized in the past. And it also states on this that the contract P298 was in consultation with board leadership and BCPS Office of Law. What year was that initiated? So good afternoon, Ms. Causey. This contract was initiated through the Baltimore County Office of Law when the board council contract with Carney Callahan was done. These were done at the same time. Okay, so I'm not aware that the board has received tax reports or tax council information the, about the services? The contract, because of 4104, the party was the board and not the school system. The Office of Law, BCPS Office of Law, has retained this firm uh, as I said in building and contracts, they predate my tenure with the school system. So uh, it's been for over 30 years we have used this tax council, and they were the only bidder when the county bid this contract. So the entity is the board because you're the contracting entity. So what year was this contract? This contract was let through the Baltimore County government, through their office of purchasing, uh, and it was the same time that the contract with Carney Callahan was bid. But you said these services have been utilized through this vendor prior to your? Yes, we've been using tax council, this tax council, for over 30 years. Okay, was it discussed in building and contracts, the hourly rate? Because I know that 
uh, as a board, we're trying to be fiscally responsible and. Ms. Uh, Posse, it was disgusting. Was it was disgusting, committee. If you'd like to um, hear the full discussion, that committee meeting recording is available. Okay, thank you. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Hine, can you give me who made the motion? Yes, it was Ms. Dolowski. Ms. Dolowski. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Abstain. Ms. Dolowski? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is consideration of the 2022-2023 Virtual Day Instruction Plan. And for that, I call on Dr. Yarbrough. Good evening. Good evening. Chair Han, Vice Chair McMillian. Superintendent Dr. Williams and members of the board. I am pleased to share an update on virtual day plans for your consideration. On October 25th, we received a new form from MSDE regarding virtual day plans. As you know, during our October 11th meeting, we presented the community survey results and proposed next steps. Based on the new guidance from the state, we are confident that our proposed plan is fully MSDE compliant and moreover, it reflects the feedback and input of members of Team BCPS. Next slide, please. Building on the success of the opportunity provided in the 2021-2022 school year, the MSDE is opening up a pathway for local education agencies to repurpose certain days as virtual school days during this school year. The days that may be considered for this opportunity include inclement weather days, staff professional learning days, high school graduation days to enable teachers to assist with or attend the graduation, or other similar circumstances described in this application. School systems now have the opportunity to use a total of eight days as a virtual day for the aforementioned purposes. School systems that transition to virtual inclement weather days must attest to the following. No more than eight virtual days with a maximum of three asynchronous days. A minimum of four hours of synchronous instruction for all students on virtual learning days. Attendance must be taken for students and teachers during virtual days, asynchronous or synchronous. Virtual days cannot negatively impact student grades, opportunity to make up work missed on those days will be provided. Once approved by MSDE, the virtual instructional plan must be posted on the school website and virtual inclement weather day plans must be presented at a publicly accessible local system, school system board meeting. Next slide, please. As reported on October 11th, nearly 27,000 stakeholders in BCPS shared the following feedback through our community input survey. One, traditional snow days are valued by students, staff, and families. Two, staff, students, and parents do not want the school year to extend beyond the last published day of school. And finally, Staff, students, and parents are not in favor of reducing spring break or any other holidays to make up for inclement weather days. Approximately 19,000 members of Team BCPS agreed that the transition to virtual day should happen after the use of five traditional snow days. Next slide, please. As a result of stakeholder feedback with board support, we would like to move the following plan to MSDE for state approval for this school year. Days one through five, traditional inclement weather days, meaning there is no school on those days. Day six and beyond, we would transition to virtual 
as stated previously, on a two-hour delay schedule to allow staff members and students to prepare for this transition. And additionally, with the new change being proposed by MSDE, high schools that have graduations at 10 a.m. or 2.30 p.m. on weekdays, that we would allow those schools to transition to asynchronous learning to allow maximum staff and student participation on those days. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the 2022-2023 virtual day instruction plan? So moved. Is there a second? Second, to Hassan. Second, Offerman. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Madam Chair, I put question in the chat as quick as I could. Um, We're in the middle of a vote. Mrs. Causey, is, what was your question? On the first slide, it says no more than eight virtual days with a maximum of three asynchronous days. And then right next to it, it says minimum of four hours of synchronous instruction for all students. So I do, that doesn't seem consistent. Sure, I can respond uh, to that. Thank you, Dr. Yarbrough. Thank you for that question. No more than eight virtual days over the inclement uh, period of time total. However, when we have synchronous virtual days, one of the state requirements is on synchronous days, we provide at least four hours of synchronous instruction. Okay, so it's five virtual days that would have four hours of instruction and then three days that could be asynchronous. Yes, that could be a choice of a school system, yes. Okay, to me that sounds like a lot of virtual learning, so. Thank you for all your work on this, but I'll, I, I won't be supporting this. Thank you. Dr. Hager? So after the fifth um, uh, inclement weather day, would it be asynchronous or synchronous, or we have the discretion in the moment to decide on that? So we would have discretion in the moment to decide that, but I thank you for that question because the plan as it's proposed, we are not proposing eight days of virtual. We are proposing five traditional days, and on day six and beyond, then we would transition to virtual. Exactly, and, that, and we don't, we're not specifying whether it's asynchronous or synchronous at that point. Yes, not yet. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, Ms. Gover, would you please continue, restart the roll call vote? Thank Ms. you. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Dolesky? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is unfinished business, consideration of board policies. And for that, I call on the PRC chair, Ms. Rowe. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Members of the board, the policy review committee asks that the board accept the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policies. Policy 3250, non-instructional services, purchasing, selection of design and construction consultants, Policy 7110, Facilities and Construction, Planning, Determining Needs. Policy 8360, Internal Board Policies, Ethics Code, Applicability and Definitions. Policy 8362, Internal Board Policies, Ethics Code, Gifts. Policy 8363, Internal Board Policies, Ethics Code, Conflict of Interest, Prohibited contact, Conduct. This recommendation is presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit M. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the board's policy review committee? So moved, Taker. Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Dolesky? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. 
Ms. Hen. Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is consideration of the proposed 2023-2024 school calendar. And for that, I call on Ms. Charlie Green and Ms. Bielski. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Board Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillan, Dr. Williams, and members of the Board of Education. In accordance with Board Policy and Superintendent's Rule 6301, the superintendent is charged with convening a committee to insist in the development of a school calendar. On September 27th, I came before you to present the committee's recommendation for a pre-Labor Day calendar. Since then, we have received questions from the board and from members of the community. We are here today to answer those questions, provide clarity for the board's consideration so that the board can make a decision. If you can move to the next slide, please. Maryland state law dictates both the minimum number of school days and the minimum number of student contact hours that must be met annually by all Maryland school systems. Of note on this slide is the minimum of 180 student days that are required, as well as 191 maximum teacher days. Uh, in between that, we see that in addition to days, there, there are also requirements for the number of hours that must be met. In high school, that's 1,170 elementary and middle schools, it's 1,080. Next slide, please. State law also spells out holidays to be observed in Maryland's public schools and minimally included in all school calendars. Those 14 days are depicted on this slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. This slide indicates the number of board-approved professional development days to be included in the school calendar. Per the board's direction, for those holidays falling on a weekend, the professional development day was scheduled for either the preceding Friday or following Monday. Diwali, Lunar New Year, and Eid al-Fitr were approved by the board to be recognized as a professional development day for teachers and school closure for students at its meeting November 23, 2021. Eid al hadha and Juneteenth fall outside of the school year, therefore no professional development will be available and students will not be present in school. Next slide, please. In addition to the requested professional development days, the proposed calendar includes a closure day for elementary school conferences, as well as five scheduled early release days for students in all schools. All closures and all hours in which students are not in school must be taken into consideration in computing student days and student contact hours. Next slide, please. The committee's pre-Labor Day recommendation was based on the infeasibility of a post-Labor Day calendar option. A post-Labor Day start would cause the calendar to run over by one teacher day, and that would be 192 days, and the committee did not see a way to adjust the calendar to meet the student and teacher day requirement. In fact, the only way to modify the post-Labor Day calendar to avoid running over would be, and there are a couple of options, to pay teachers and support staff to work an additional day, so beyond that 191 days, uh, to cut a pre-service teacher day from the week teachers report back to school. We have not had agreement on this. Uh, we do have members represented on the calendar committee. And then to make a PD day a non-school day for students and teachers, which would be inequitable because uh, a decision would have to be made as to which of those approved professional development days would be the day that would be chosen. Also, as you see on the slide, uh, the option of reducing the number of inclement weather days to meet requirements was not an option because this calendar uses actually only the minimum number of inclement weather days. So this calendar includes three inclement weather days provided for the board, just for your information, uh, is our usage over the past few years to see how many uh, inclement weather days we've used in the past. 
So again, we provide this information uh, to you uh, to provide clarity and certainly to answer additional questions that we've received. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Joelle Bilski, our Manager of Staff Relations, as well as Ms. Megan Shea, uh, who is the Executive Director for Teaching and Learning and a member of the Calendar Committee. Together, they will address questions that were raised by both the Board and the community since the proposed calendar was presented on September 27th. Ms. Bilski. Thank you. Good evening. Next slide, please. So this slide includes responses to questions received since the September 27th presentation to the board. Answers to question one and two were provided to the board in a weekly update. Next slide, please. This slide includes responses to board member requests for survey information. This information was also provided to the board in a weekly update. Next slide, please. This slide provides additional detail on school start day survey of BCPS staff. Next slide, please. And so, good evening. Just wanted to share that the calendar committee that Ms. Charlie Green referenced is comprised of a wide range of stakeholders, including school administrators, teachers, central office staff, and uh, parent and community stakeholders represented from the groups listed on the slide, including many of our bargaining units, as well as some of our parent advisory council members as well. And so with that, we will take any questions the board may have regarding the calendar recommendation. I have a motion to approve the 2023, excuse me. Question. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, uh, Mr. McMillian. So when was the uh, last calendar committee meeting with uh, all of the union leadership? The committee met on May 16th, 2022, and May 23rd, 2022. Uh, Ms. Shea, were there any subsequent meetings following nope, that? Nope, those are the two meetings. Okay, so those were uh, prior to the uh, virtual learning days being uh, discussed and proposed. I'm not sure I understand. Can you repeat that, Ms. Causey? So those were May 16 and May 23rd were before the uh, finalization of the virtual learning day. So I'm wondering what is the impact of the virtual learning uh, that was approved that could assist the calendar? All right, Ms. Causey, because, just, please go ahead. Ms. Causey, well, we, we, yes, we all heard from um, Mr. Burke and um, Ms. Sexton and others about the calendar, um, with especially related to professional development and having some number of hours available where it is not on a professional development day, that's also on a holiday where some uh, staff would be missing. So to understand your question, yes, it is correct that that was before that discussion was held that the committee met, correct? Um, I'm, I'm trying to clarify. I know we just heard from Dr. Yarborough related to the professional learning plan for the current year. Um, are you talking about the virtual learning days for the previous year? I just want to make sure I understand. No, for the future year. Okay, understood. Yes, you are correct. Okay, Mr. Kuhn. Thank Questions, you. Mr. Kuhn. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the PowerPoint presentation, slide five, um, <clears throat> and it has closure and early release days listed here. Um, my question is, the last, it has two days, the last two days of the school year uh, showing as three hour early release days. And my question is, it looks like those two days go beyond the 180-day requirement, 
and they're basically short days where nothing gets done. I'm curious as to why we even have those days on the calendar. Since they're, they go beyond the 180 or 180 or 181 required days, if, if I'm reading this calendar correctly, uh, someone can you know pipe up and tell me that I'm not reading it correctly, but I'm, I'm curious as to why we have those two days tacked on to the end of the year that are half days where there's, there's no instruction or learning going on. I would uh, defer to Ms. Shea as she was on the calendar committee, and I don't know if you would, you'd like to also address the teaching and learning on the, fi on the final two days of sure, school as so, well. So thank you for that. Um, I do want to pipe up Mr. Kuhn and offer that I think you may possibly be reading it incorrectly, because those two days do count. Um, the reason that they're early closure for students is to afford our teachers time for grading and reporting to make sure that they're able to report accurately on progress for our students. Um, and then I'd be remiss if I didn't say, we do hope there's teaching and learning happening until the very last moment. Um, if nothing else, they could be reading or writing and sharing their plans for the summer. So I know I'm a little Pollyanna, but that would be our hope and expectation. But I do believe those days are counted in both the student count and the teacher count by contract. Okay, okay. I, I'm looking at the recommended 23-24 pre labor day item that's attached page four has June of 2024. And I'm just trying to understand how to read this. Um, it shows 183 to 183, and I'm get, and that must be in school days if I'm, if I'm reading that correctly. Yes, so that includes the three inclement weather days. So we're required to build in a minimum of three inclement weather. So that's where you're seeing the 183. If we didn't use those inclement weather days, it's to make sure we have at a minimum 180. Mm -hmm. What is the, why does it say 183-184? I don't understand that. It's either, it, 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 it has 183, total 183-184, but teacher staff days are 194. So I'm just trying to understand like if you take those three extra days away, right, because right. we didn't close, you would have 181 or 180 based on what I'm looking at. So again, I'm I'm trying to understand this to make sure that that I follow it. Uh, that's that's really what my questions are about. That's can you see that? Yes. I, 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 I so apologize it, for interrupting. Yeah, is it 183 or is it 184? That's kind of I don't know know why it would be. Elementary either. schools have one fewer day uh, in terms of the number of hours, so the elementary calendar is slightly shorter. And so I believe that accounts for the adjustment, but I would certainly defer to my colleagues at the table if I am misinterpreting. That's that, correct that because is. of the elementary conference day. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. It's just trying to follow it. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. that. And then the other, well, the last question I have has to do with. Um, you know, the fact that based on uh, page nine, uh, page eight and nine of your presentation, it's, it's showing BCPS employees, you know, were part of a, a, a school survey and did they favor pre or post Labor Day starts? And it looks as if, you know, they, they wanted a post Labor Day start, as did the last time uh, the community was was open to to take a look at this by 60 percent, 60 percent to 40 percent wanted post Labor Day. So, Mr. Um, Kuhn, yeah, pl you have a few seconds, please. OK, wrap you. it up. So uh, I'm just curious as to why we don't have a post Labor Day option at all. And, and thank you for that question. Uh, the calendar com committee made the decision not to move forward a post uh, Labor Day calendar because of the infeasibility of moving forward. They were unable to reconcile uh, the overage of teacher days. Um, and I, I can't recall the slide, but there were a number of options that would need to be considered in order to meet that need, and they were not able to reconcile that. For that reason, they put forward a pre-Labor Day calendar. 
Uh, we have received uh, recommendations from members of the community on how that can be reconciled. I do believe comments made by Billy Burke earlier are correct and at least match our experience, and that close analysis of those alternative calendars show that those calendars missed uh, some required dates. And basically, every iteration we came up with where we met all of the requirements, uh, we were not able to reconcile and, and, and move forward a post-Labor Day calendar. All right, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Golosky? Hi, thank you so much for putting that together. And I don't mean to beat a dead horse, um, but um, echoing that the teachers seemed to want in a large percent the post-Labor Day start, combined with the teachers expressing the negative effect of the, um, the religious holiday days, where if they're observant of that holiday, it adds extra stress. I just believe I have to stand on behalf of the teachers, the ones who are struggling and stressed right now, um, that, of course, we can't please everybody, but to to honor what the teachers need, I think would be the most important. I wonder if it's possible with those religious holidays to amend when it does fall on a weekend that um, maybe the schools are not canceled. Like I know for many, many years with Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, um, going back many years, if the holiday fell on a weekend, there was never a weekday holiday. That was never something that was practiced. So perhaps giving everybody the holiday, I think that's a wonderful idea, but maybe not honoring, if it falls on a Sunday, honoring it on that Monday is just something else to consider to possibly open up another option. And I don't know if that was looked at or not. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, and thank you for the question. The, the calendar committee did not look, look at that option as it was a, a board uh, directive to uh, honor the holiday, whether it either you know, either on the Friday before or the Monday after. So the calendar committee operated within those parameters. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have a motion you wanted to make, Ms. Dolosky, to that I mean, effect? I don't know if I can because I know we're running late, but if, if that is an option to look at, I think. What would the, be the impact of, of such a change at this point? I would have to, and, and I don't know if, uh, Ms. Shea, you can help me with this, but I think since the committee did not consider that, I don't know that they have a um, mocked-up calendar as to what that would look like. Um, I think that would have to be additional work the team would have to do just to go through, create that calendar, and be able to identify what the potential impact would be. Can I ask a point of clarification? Sure. Um, were you offering that then there would be a day that was professional development day that didn't fall on a holiday, or are you offering that those two holidays that fall on a weekend would just shorten the last day of school? I, either or. I, I you know, because I know you guys have your constraints too. To where? So yeah. even having those two days. Um, but I, you know, I would be open to either or, you know, just... I'm just thinking about the teachers, of and course. I know that so many have expressed the making up of the staff development in terms of training, and you know they, they just don't need any more stress. But you guys have worked extremely hard, and right. I'm not trying to shoot the messenger by any means, but I do feel like anything we can do for the teachers is just wonderful. Of course. And if I can, if, if I can. Yeah, please. Um, so two things. One, that's also one of the reasons that the committee did not want to shorten the professional development days prior to the school year, which you saw was one of the options because those days are so important for teachers. Um, second, we, oh, we are also pro-teachers, so I appreciate that, that perspective. Um, I will share we too, in, at least in teaching and learning, we've heard a lot of feedback from teachers about how challenging it is to have professional learning. Um, at the same time, as this board knows, we also talk a lot about how critically important professional learning and training is for teachers to feel they have what they need. 
uh, what my team's been trying to do is to repeat sessions. So because oftentimes it's a different population that is observing the religious holiday. And so what we've tried to do as we move forward with the state, because this was new for us too this year, was to try to repeat sessions. So sessions that may have been offered on Rosh Hashanah, we repeated on Diwali. So that while there may be an individual that honors both, in the large majority, perhaps we would be able to alleviate some of that because we heard the same feedback from teachers. So I just offer that we are also listening and, and trying right. to, su to support teachers. My, in terms of the question of the impact, I think, Ms. Charlie Green, we would have to bring the committee back together to, to see what the impact would be of, of that recommendation because there isn't a third option that did that. And the time, we understand the constraints with scheduling and the need to right. get this approved and published. So I think Dr. Williams wants to comment, yes. so I'll turn it over to him. So I believe your policy states that the first board meeting in November, you have to approve the calendar. So if there are any iterations or changes to the direction that the board provided us, I was going to say exactly what Ms. Shea, we will have to reconvene the committee we would have to look at all the parameters and then come back to the board with a recommendation. Um, I, I wouldn't want the team to try to make a decision right on this spot, knowing just all the nuances and to any motion that's being made. So I just want to bring that to the board's attention. So if it's, if it's the desire for a motion for anything to happen, additional option, we would have to reconvene the committee and then I th we are not following the policy, but that's sure. something that the board can discuss to then bring some closure as to what direction you would like for us to go. But um, I'm, I'm a little concerned about the timing of all of this with the committee and members, and I don't know, and I will not put Joelle on the spot, <laughs> but I don't know if next meeting is November 22nd. I don't know if the timing of that is is realistic. Thank I'm you. not sure. I'm not sure. I just want to bring some sure. clarity to the board and just just so you know the constraints that we may have. Okay. And I'd like to consult um, board council with a question regarding the policy, Mr. Mercedes. Should the board approve the calendar with the understanding that there may be changes or a motion to look at tweaks to that calendar would that be compliant with our policy because we have changes to the calendar for other reasons throughout the year if we adopt a calendar can, you... can we mod mm. can we make that modification or adopt a partial calendar with the understanding that we will make a decision on the holidays as Ms. Tolesky said obviously not the preferred way uh, it's probably not pressing but I don't see, it that I don't see a, a, an absolute yeah. bar to doing that okay. thank you and Mrs. Hassan Yes, thank you. Um, so I do want to speak to um, the existence of religious holidays, especially to minority religious holidays. Um, as I've publicly shared, I'm, I'm a Muslim American, so that professional development day is essential for me. And I, I always make the argument, well, if Christmas were on a Saturday, you'd still have winter break, um, especially considering that a lot of religious holidays span more than one day, including Muslim holidays. Um, not all Muslims celebrate all three days of some holidays, but it is essential to consider. Um, not only that, I think it, it it is important to acknowledge that those professional development days are important. Um, and I know that you guys have put in the work, and I see that work, and I appreciate that. Um, but I, I think if we're if we're talking about religious holidays, my fear is that if we if we say okay, well. Eid al-Adha is on a Saturday or Eid al-Fitr is on a Saturday. Let's just not include it on the calendar and put a little asterisk. My fear is that in the next year, um, the, coming, in the coming discussions will be, well, we didn't have it last year. Why should we have it this year? And that's honestly a, a major fear because it took years to even get a day like this on the calendar and, and a lot of, of discussion and, and pushing from community members and students and parents and teachers just to include these religious holidays. So I think it's essential to realize that, 
you know, like our, our calendars do set precedent. The fact that we had Diwali and Lunar New Year um, approved last year is why we have it this year. So that's just my argument on, on keeping those religious holidays, even if they do fall on a Saturday or a Sunday. Thank you. I, I see hands and a lot of activity in the chat. So, Ms. Rowe, you've been waiting, I believe. Has you yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things we've done in the past right off the bat is to have the calendar committee from the start submit two calendars, one that is pre-Labor Day and one that's post-Labor Day. And there are other jurisdictions in the state who've had no difficulty coming up with a a post Labor Day calendar. And I think that moving forward this with this, it would be a good idea to come up with some sort of um, consistency, like maybe if Labor Day is um, September 1st through the 4th, it could be post. And if it's September 5th through the 7th, it could be pre. But I, I fear that we're gonna go back into the situation that caused this debate in the first place where school starts starting earlier and earlier and earlier in the summer and that we're basically trying to move to all year round school and i don't i think from our survey we can see that the community doesn't support all year round school and i i'd like to see both calendars from the get-go Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Dr. Hager, did you have? Okay, you had a couple of questions. And okay, that was to Ross, never mind. Mrs. Causey? Thank you. Um, quickly to uh, slide nine, if that can be put up. Every bargaining unit preferred a post-Labor Day start. Ask me case ESPB, OPE, TAPCO. Hmm. Parents preferred a post-Labor Day start. Employees, slide eight, preferred a post-Labor Day start. So um, I would like to, uh, I would like to not take a vote until there is a post Labor Day option. And I appreciate from what I've heard about um, concerns from teachers of the professional development day being on their holiday. And Thank as you. a board member that that's time, Mrs. Causey. Thank you. Dr. Hager. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to echo what uh, Ms. Hassan said and mentioned, you know, Easter is always on a Sunday, and yet we've always head off on Monday. And so I, I really um, am very concerned about this conversation about um, taking away any of the holidays that we added to the calendar. Um, one of the things I'm most proud of of this board over the past two years is the addition of these holidays to the calendar and to have it be so inclusive in a, in a, in a school system that is so diverse. And so I think that that's a real value add to what we've done. Um, I also want to point out that the um, the survey didn't ask about year-round school, so that that's an, like an extrapolation from the data. Also, the sample sizes are very low by bargaining unit. Um, if we were going to put as much weight into this survey as people are putting into it, I would have a million questions about how the survey was done, whether people could answer more than once, whether they looked at IP addresses. I mean, I have like a million questions if, if we're going to put that much weight into these survey responses. Meanwhile, over the past two years since I joined the board, we've had extensive discussions about the value of pre-Labor Day start. And I don't know that that's what we're talking about today. I feel like today we're talking about this calendar. Um, and we could go back and look at the recordings and have all those discussions again about the AP test preparation and the availability of summer camps. I mean, we've talked about it at length. So I, I don't know, I worry that we're, we're getting, going down the wrong rabbit hole that we've been down before. Um, and I think that this calendar is wonderful. I think the, the, you've put a lot of effort into it. And, um, and again, I, I think if we want to talk about the survey, then we can take a deeper dive, but I don't know that that was the purpose of this conversation. So that's all. Thank you. Can I add one quick thing just to, for the context of these questions? That um, the committee did go into this with the idea of offering a pre and a post, but if you look at slide six, slide six details that if we had brought you a post calendar, it's not possible 
And so I just want to honor that for the purpose of efficiency and knowing your timeline in the um, board policy, slide six really captures the discussion of why the post Labor Day start was not also presented. So I didn't want anyone to think the committee didn't recognize and I would offer that the survey was prior to the committee meeting. And so, yes, it, you know, people have preferences. I like summer, <laughs> um, although I, we don't really have it, but you know what I mean? But my, um, I just want to offer that we recognize that that was a preference, but this really captures why this calendar is the one being recommended, not for lack of discussion or, or reflection of that survey. Okay. Thank you. So, Ms. Teleski, I know you have a comment. I have a follow-up question to that, Ms. Shea. So, um, to slide six, to your point, mm -hmm. there are three options that are listed here where a post-Labor Day start could be feasible. Not ideal, as Mr. Brusetti said, not the preferred way to go about doing it. But to say that it's not possible, I don't think is exactly true in that you, you outline here three possible scenarios in which a post-Labor Day could be feasible. One, option three, being make a PD day a non-school day for you, students and teachers. You are correct. Not possible is different than not feasible and not preferred by the committee or recommended. I would offer the number one would require renegotiation of the contract, which is where the not possible piece came in. But of you're course, one and, one and two highly unlikely, three, right. certainly within the realm of possibility. But I'm, it, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the question of equity came up related to uh, number three in terms of the PD days being that they are religious holidays. You know, which PD day would we be speaking of? And so I think that's the reason why the committee, and, and I did not serve on the calendar committee. I'm familiar with their work, and I know they really grappled with this. And so I do want to echo Ms. Shea's comments that the committee, um, and we did include who they were comprised of, so they are also teachers, educators, parents, family members, so they are representative of those very groups that completed the survey. And they did want to honor uh, the, you know, the, the wishes of everyone, and so they tried to do that. They bring these forward because these are the barriers. Uh, it is certainly, if it is the board's desire to do something different or to remove barriers, then that, that's the decision before the board. But I do want to honor the work of the committee to say that they did, they were aware of all of those things, they did take those into consideration, and they put forth what the barriers were to moving forward a post-Labor Day calendar. Thank you. Mrs. Causey and then Mr. McMillian. Ms. Causey's out of time. She's out of time. Okay, Mr. McMillian. I support the committee. And I'm going to use Dr. Hager's comment about going down this rabbit hole. We've been down this rabbit hole. We gave you a directive, and you followed the directive, and you constructed the calendar the way that, based on the information that we gave you. Now we're coming back, you know, wanting to flip it, want to change it. You know, I support the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, Ms. Joes? I'll keep it quick. I, I do support what Mr. McMillian just said and Dr. Hager echoed. We've been down this at least three, four times in the past, and we've talked about equity. We've talked about learning loss. We've talked about not all our school children can afford long summer vacations. Some of them need to be in school for food, and we've talked about this in length, so I really do support the work of the committee. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Causey is out of time. However, she did put a motion in the chat. So for the purpose of discussion and to honor her motion, I will read it, and read it for her. Um, she moves that the, this is her motion. She moves that the board uh, approval of the calendar be delayed to evaluate a post-Labor Day start and the impact of virtual inclement weather days. Is there a second? Second, Roe. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Um, you read it again, do you mind? Yes. Uh, um, Ms. Causey moves that the board approval of the calendar be delayed to evaluate a post-Labor Day start and the impact of virtual inclement weather days. And it was seconded by Ms. Rowe. I would offer an amendment um, to Mrs. Causey's motion to also evaluate um, Ms. Tulusky's suggestion regarding holidays, if she would accept that amendment. Mrs. Causey. Yes, ma'am, I was just typing the chat. May I speak to the motion? 
I need a second to my amendment. Second, Ms. Causey. <laughs> second row. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mercedes, may Mrs. Causey speak to her motion well, at speak new time? To the speak to the amendment. So, um, Mrs. Delusky, would you like to speak to, since it's, it was your suggestion? Um, I don't know. I don't know if we should keep it separate. I mean, would I hear like everybody's concerns about all the progress that we've made. You know, we're not going to please everybody. You all have worked very, very hard. I just feel as though <laughs> somebody has to advocate also for the teachers and for their complaints in terms of, you know, what is the best for them given their struggles right now? We can keep it separate. So I'll, I'll withdraw I, my amendment. I just, you and know. Mrs. Causey, do you want to speak to your, do you withdraw your second? And do you want to speak to your motion? I would, I would um, not like to withdraw my second because I think it, we're not asking them, we're not a, approving one thing, we're just asking them to evaluate it and you know, we have heard from our stakeholders tonight about teachers' concern about professional development. Um, also related to what is vital right now is retaining and Ms. recruiting Hang on, Mrs. Teachers. Causey. Mrs. Causey, yes, are you, so are you speaking to the amendment or are you speaking to the motion? And do you withdraw your second to my amendment? I would not like to withdraw my second. Ms. Hen? Yes. It is two separate questions. I believe we could simply separate the questions and vote on them separately. Okay. May I have a um, roll call vote on the amendment to Mrs. Causey's motion to ask staff to evaluate the impact of holidays that occur on weekends to the calendar? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Dulesky? Yes. Ms. Jones? No. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Hassan? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Scott? No. Dr. Hager? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Favor is five. Okay, so that motion fails. Um, now we can process the original motion. Ms. Causey, do you want to speak to your motion? Yes, thank you. Um, one of the things that's most vital right now is uh, having staff. And when we see a survey, and I understand uh, questions about how many people, but it is what we have to work with. Uh, when every um, employee union wants a post-Labor Day start, when the other counties that are adjacent to us have a post-Labor Day start, which would make things easier if people uh, live in one county, work in another, and so forth. Um, so I think it is worthwhile for a delay to evaluate that. And the last thing I'll say is uh, I pulled up policy 6301, and I don't see a date in there requiring approval in November. Um, and actually, the last, last thing I'll say is um, and I'm not going to put it in the motion, but I think we've heard it where um, if there's professional development where it's not a holiday uh, so that everyone can participate. And Anne Arundel County, um, we heard at Babe's conference their uh, equity from policy to action from their Office of Equity and Accelerate Student Achievement. And they just do a two-hour release. I believe it's uh, once a quarter to make sure that there is an opportunity system-wide, uh, whether it's new curriculum, whether it's, uh, you know, discipline, an issue that we have right now, uh, whether it's training for new employees, um, to have that flexibility. I think it's, it meets the needs of improving morale and also uh, getting that instructional professional development piece where everyone uh, has the same opportunity. Thank you. Any other comments? D Dr. Hager? Um, I just want to say again, I think we're 
as a survey person and a numbers person, we're putting a lot of weight into the survey that we did not hear the methods for. We didn't hear any of the, the background data. And, and if, if I thought we would be in this deep of a discussion, I would have sent those questions ahead of time so we would be prepared to discuss this survey. In years past, we've had stakeholders lined up talking about pre and post Labor Day. We've had these discussions before. I'm just really quite surprised that, um, that this much weight is being put into a survey with such a small sample size, especially by bargaining unit and things like that. Um, so that's all. Thank you. Okay, hearing no further um, guests, Dr. Williams. I just want to reiterate what our presenter shared on slide six about the constraints and barriers. And not only do will the committee have to go back and discuss, but there's contractual things that we will have to discuss. And so uh, Joelle mentioned the, the, the um, constraints or desires of the board. You wanted us to proceed. I do want to clarify, for the last two or three years, we provided a pre and post calendar for this board. But I think Dr. Hager said it beautifully. We spent last year so much time on this discussion, we reached a, a agreement. I'm really concerned about the amount of work and the timing to go back and look at um, these constraints and trying to address these constraints, whether it's the first meeting in November that approval is, is you're seeking or something down the road. I, I just think there's a lot of work that that committee would have to do and we would have to do with our union partners. And so, uh, again, I want to thank the committee for presenting the options and really articulating with a slide why uh, it's infeasible, impossible, whatever terminology we want to use to look at a post-Labor Day option. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned about the motion that's on the floor for the group to go back and do something that is inf infeasible, impossible, and will require some negotiations with our unions, which we're fine. We meet regularly with them, but it's the amount of work that I don't know if we can reach agreement based on what was presented. So, so I just want to just echo that, highlight that for this board as you're about to make a vote on uh, this amended motion. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Williams. And, and I do not speak to the motion, to this either. Um, I think this board is acutely aware of our staffing needs. It comes up every meeting. It's something that um, we've tried to prioritize, taking care of our people. I spoke to it tonight. And again, I wouldn't, I hear doc, what Dr. Hager saying about the sample size on the survey. I have a lot of questions myself. At the same time, it's hard to ignore when individuals are showing a, a preference across our, our units, um, a strong preference in all but one for a post-Labor Day start. And I've supported a pre-Labor Day start. I shifted gears to address learning loss, to address a lot of concerns that we heard. Um, it's hard to ignore these numbers um, in, in terms of preferences. And it's hard to ignore um, the needs of our staff when we are in crisis with the staff, with our staffing situation, because we have, the system has pulled out all stops to try to attract and retain our people. Um, so I will be supporting this motion for that reason, even though I have the same hesitancy about the numbers and the survey data, just because whatever we can do to make um, BCPS a, a better place to work and not to lose to neighboring school systems, as Mrs. Causey said, that do have the post-Labor Day start. If I, sorry, if I just might add a, uh, two things. One being that, um, yes, the survey results were gathered and the committee was driven to provide both a pre and a post Labor Day calendar. And what was shown through that work with the post Labor Day was that it was not feasible. And when we went back to the union to say it's not feasible unless one of these three things happens, um, they were not, TABCO was not four, two, or three that's illustrated on the slide. And if you look at number one, as Dr. Williams just said, we would have to negotiate it and it would, it would have fiscal implications. So this isn't something that we could really do quickly, pulling, all, pulling the uh, committee together. They come from various, you know, stakeholders. So, um, you know, calendars certainly have to be considered. We plan these meetings 
pretty far out in order to accommodate and make sure every voice is at the table. So that's one thing. And then also just considering that even if we did go back to the table, as, to, as Cindy Sexton and Billy Burke said at the beginning of this meeting, they were representing their unions and supporting this after seeing post was not feasible. Thank you. Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote? I'm sorry. Yes. I had a comment. She had a comment. Oh, I didn't see it in the chat. Go ahead, Ms. Joes. Quick comment. I, I do want to state that, uh, you know, we all do want what's best for our teachers, but today Mr. Billy Burke, who represents Case, said he prefers a pre-Labor Day calendar. TAPCO said we have to do what's best for students. Ms. Cindy Sexton is right here on October 11th. She said TAPCO preferred a pre-Labor Day calendar. There's over 3,000 teachers, so there's going to be some uh, yes and no, and that's to be accepted. So I just want to clarify that that's not true, that we're not uh, listening to our teachers or principals or bargaining units. Okay. Have a vote, please. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Stolowski? Yeah. Oh. yeah. Ms. Jost? No. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Sasan? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Scott? No. Dr. Hager? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Favor is five. Okay, so that motion fails. We now have... May I have a motion to approve the 2023-2024 school calendar as presented in Exhibit N? So moved, Hassan. Is there a second? Second, Hager. Any discussion? Yeah. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on college and career readiness, rigorous coursework, AP, IB, CTE, dual enrollment college credit. And for that, I call on Dr. McComas and Dr. Zarchin. So I'm gonna get them started as they're transitioning because I'm watching the time board. Um, learning accountability and results, CCR, rigorous coursework, also known as college and career readiness, uh, is being presented by the Division of Curriculum and Instruction and the collaboration with the Division of Schools. So as you know, this, this evening we had Dr. Boswell McComas, Dr. Zarchett, and Ms. Jewel Ralph, proud principal, Western School of Technology, Environmental Science. We share the programs and opportunities BCPS offers to ensure that our students are prepared for their futures after high school. A board goal that aligns to this is ensuring all students are enrolled in courses that adequately prepare them to be college and career ready upon graduation. This evening, you'll hear about specific ways BCPS makes uh, this happen for students. This slide shows the connection to our compass, our pathway to excellence in learning, accountability, and results section. The goal is simple, preparing each child to graduate ready to enter their chosen career, career training, military training, or credit-bearing college course. Our work is to provide the necessary supports that will deliver on this promise. If you can move to the blueprint slide, beginning in 2023 and 2024, next slide please. The school system, school systems in Maryland will be required to provide all students who meet college career ready standards access to three pathways to, for, to future success at no cost to the students. This evening we will share with you how BCPS is already fulfilling many components of the future requirement. Next slide. The BCPS framework of college and career readiness offers students a rich advanced placement program, a comprehensive dual enrollment program, and a wealth of career and technical education programs in every high school. 
These programs set our students up for success on college and career readiness uh, assessments and college level credit bearing courses and industry recognized internships, apprenticeships, work based learning opportunities and training programs. This is the value added aspect of our educational system. Students in BCPS do not just graduate with a high school diploma, they leave with college credit, college acceptances, scholarships, apprenticeships, industry credentials and jobs making above minimum wage salaries. The next slide speaks to the system improvement teams. Um, we have the system improvement teams that address college career readiness. Uh, there are several, the GTAP and IB. That team is charged with monitoring equitable access and increasing rigor for students. The CTE AVID team is charged with ensuring equitable access to CTE and AVID programs and ensuring successful completion. The CCR assessment is charged with collecting and analyzing data from PSAT, SAT, ACT, and ACCUPLACER to provide support to schools for preparation, um, participation, and performance. And the last system improvement team, CCR graduation team, is charged with identifying best practices to ensure students are college and career ready and to increase the graduation rate. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Boswell McComas. Thank you, Dr. Williamson. Good evening, members of the board. Um, our next stop on our journey this evening as we explore college and career readiness opportunities for our students is in the International Baccalaureate Program. Next slide, please. We are proud to um, offer many pathways in our framework for CCR. Uh, International Baccalaureate is one program. Next slide, please. Next so. slide, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, our IB magnet programs are available at Kenwood and Newtown High Schools, and both of our schools offer an IB middle years program, not to be confused with middle school, but the middle years program um, is a program for students in grades 9 and 10, as well as offering an IB diploma program option for those students who are... Um, juniors and seniors. In addition, Newtown High School also offers the IB career-related program options for juniors and seniors. All students in uh, grades 11 and 12 can opt to take additionally a standalone IB course as a course candidate. They may be students who are not uh, pursuing the full diploma or the full career uh, program, but just wish to take an IB course just like you might take an advanced placement course. Uh, and they're referred to as course candidates. Uh, uh, for which they could be awarded college credit. Next slide, please. Additionally, during the uh, last school year, the 2021-2022 school year, uh, there were 14 IB courses offered collectively at both um, Kenwood and Newtown high schools. There were, uh, in total, 216 students who were enrolled in our IB program or courses. And in uh, last May, we had 335 um, IB assessments administered, and 35% of our students scored a four or higher, allotting them the potential to earn college credit. A total of six IB diplomas and 11 career-related certificates were awarded to students this past summer. Next slide, please. Additionally, this year, 14 IB courses uh, continue to be offered collectively at Kenwood Newtown. There are 111 students enrolled in the formal diploma or career-related programs, keeping in mind they're juniors and seniors. The number of course candidates are yet to be determined as students are still uh, discerning if they want to do that. The focus for this year will be ongoing professional development to support our IB initiatives to increase our student enrollment and to build teacher capacity. All BCPS IB schools, including the elementary and middle schools, will participate in a collective IB evaluation cohort to prepare for formal reauthorization visits by the International Baccalaureate Organization. Next slide, please. Our next stop on our journey of CCR uh, tonight um, is exploring College Board advanced placement options for our students. Next slide, please. Our partnership with the College Board allows us to offer our students college le level, <coughs> excuse me, and potentially credit-bearing courses through the advanced placement program. As many of you know, these courses are offered at each high school and are taught by BCPS teachers. At the end of the course, our students may sit for an end of course College Board AP exam, and if they score a three, four, or five on the exam, they may be awarded college credit depending upon the institution that they attend after graduation. 
Uh, a wonderful thing happened April 26 in 2022. Uh, current Governor Hogan signed Bill 699, which mandates that all Maryland University System schools must accept scores of 3, 4, and 5 for college credit. So this is a wonderful opportunity for our students uh, who are attending University of Maryland schools. Next slide, please. Additionally, this past uh, spring, 5,736 of our students took in total 10,991 advanced placement exams. 67% of our scholars scored a three or higher, earning them uh, college credit as high school students. Next slide, please. Overall, while our data does show that 67% of our students earned a three or greater on the AP exam, a closer look at performance by student group provides us greater insight into gaps in participation and performance for sp specific students. So for example, while black or African American students comprise approximately 40% of our total student population, 26% of our students participating in one or more AP courses are black or African American. And of those, 18% of our AP students who scored a three or greater were students who are black or African American. So as a system, we have been focusing on creating deliberate and intentional opportunities for all students, and especially our students of color, to participate and meet with success in rigorous coursework. Last year, the participation rate of our black and African American students in advanced placement courses did increase by 4%. And we will continue to prioritize equity and access, equity and opportunity, and most importantly, equity and achievement for all of our students, effectively closing opportunity and achievement gaps. Next slide, please. Out of the 5,736 participating AP students, many of them earned additionally College Board Advanced Placement Scholar Distinctions. As you can see on the chart before you, there are numerous um, forms of distinction that the College Board recognized, and so I'll quickly go through and describe what each is. Students who earn the AP Scholars Distinction um, receive scores of three or higher on three or more advanced placement exams. Students who um, were acknowledged as AP scholars with honors were students who received an average score of at least a 3.25 on all AP exams and scores of three or higher on four or more of these exams. AP scholars with distinction uh, are students who receive an average score of at least 3.5 on all AP exams taken and scores of three or higher on five or more of these exams. Um, advanced placement international diplomas are students who score a three or higher on five or more advanced AP exams across multiple disciplines. AP seminar and research certificate is awarded to um, AP seminar and research um, pardon me, students who earn scores of three or higher in both the AP seminar and the AP research course. And lastly, our AP capstone diploma is awarded to students who earn scores of three of three or higher in AP seminar, AP research, and on four additional AP exams of their choice. Next slide, please. Uh, in, in closing our section on advanced placement, there are a few things additionally that we'd like to highlight for this year. This past summer, we had 100 advanced placement teachers participate um, in the Goucher Advanced Placement Summer Institute this summer. This marks the largest cohort of teachers for whom we have, a pay, have paid to attend, and the first time we have been able to provide them with a stipend in addition uh, to paying for them to attend. Um, second, this year, Milford Mill High School and Randallstown High School are two of only 64 schools across the nation piloting the new College Board Advanced Placement African American Studies course. We anticipate that half of our high schools uh, are being invited by the College Board to participate in the second year of the pilot during next school year, the 2023-2024 academic year. And lastly, this school year, for the first time, BCPS will be applying blueprint funds to pay for one AP exam for every student in BCPS and will continue to use our Title IV funds to pay for the rest of the exams for our students who qualify for fee, fee reductions. Next slide, please. 
Our next stop on our journey of CCR this evening involves dual enrollment um, and early college access programs. And so this is another opportunity whereby our students can earn college credits while they are still high school students. And in some instances, they are working on both their high school diploma and an um, associate's degree simultaneously. Next slide, please. First, we'll talk about dual enrollment. Participating in advanced uh, courses is, as we were saying, not the only way that our scholars can earn college credit while they are still in high school. But more specifically, early college access programs have grown exponentially since 2014 when uh, Senate Bill 740 was passed, requiring tuition discounts to be given to high school students taking college classes at local community and state colleges and universities. With the funding for Blueprint for Maryland's Future, we have been able to expand our tuition-free program in partnership with the Community College of Baltimore County. Our tuition-free program is now available to all high school students. Students can take credit and non-credit bearing courses, courses that lead to industry credentials and continuing education courses completely free. We even pay for fees and books. These college classes are taught by CCBC college instructors and we currently have over uh, 1,000 BCPS students uh, take college courses at CCBC each fall and spring semester. Next slide please. Our first semester of expansion was just this past summer, and uh, the summer of 2022, and our summer enrollment went up by 65% thanks to these blueprint funds. This fall, our enrollment is currently up by approximately 22% as well. Next slide, please. We continue to work towards equity and participation in dual enrollment, just as we do in advanced placement, and as we um, do in all of our college, uh, early college access programs. Next slide, please. Our um, BCPS partnership with the Community College of Baltimore County, we offer over 50 dual credit courses for our students. The courses you see on the screen before you are the 24 most popular uh, courses, and it just gives you a sense of the enrollment uh, for those most popular of the 50. Next slide, please. In addition to students being able to take a dual enrollment course, we also have early college um, high school programs. So these are very specific, specific and scripted programs whereby students are simultaneously working on their high school diploma and their um, AA degree. Research shows that, our, that not just our students, but all students who participate in dual enrollment, uh, particularly early college high school programs, are more likely to enroll in college post high school and to earn a degree within five years compared to those students who do not participate in any form of dual enrollment or early college high school experience. Our early college program at Woodlawn High School is a collegiate preparatory program that combines high school and college in a supportive yet rigorous educational environment. Through our partnership with CCBC, students have the opportunity to simultaneously earn both diplomas. Students uh, uh, and their AA degree is in general studies. Additionally, uh, they can earn up to 60 credits towards a bachelor's degree, which may be eligible for reciprocal credit at any four-year college or university. Our students earn credits through coursework completed at both the high school campus and at the community college campus. College credits are tuition free and our students are provided textbooks for their classes. CTE is also in the game of early college access programs. CTE is also pleased to offer two pathways in technology early college high school programs, typically referred to as PTEC. Dundalk High School is in its fifth year of implementation, while Owings Mills is in year three. Our students graduate high school not only with their diploma, but also an associate's degree and a six-week paid internship free of charge. Next slide. In addition, uh, CTE um, has some innovative programs. Two of our newest programs um, include aviation technology and artificial intelligence in response to the expanding industry of unmanned systems and advancements in computer science. Um, some of you also have participated in uh, experiences with our food trailer as well. So uh, another uh, innovative program by our CTE team. Next slide, please. I got a little ahead of myself. Our next journey is further uh, deep dive in CTE. Next slide, please. 
So CTE is an integral part of college and career readiness as we've already begun to discuss. Rather, that's rigorous coursework leading to industry credentials, extracurricular activities such as robotics or managing our food trailer, or even our junior ROTC programs. All students have the opportunity to prepare for success after BCPS. Next slide. What's important to know is that while CTE may best be known for our high school programs of study, the truth is career exposure begins at the elementary level. And at the middle grades, we build career awareness and ultimately career exploration through uh, and preparation at the high school level. Students are concurrently prepared for career seeking and advancement through our ECAP programs, work-based learning programs, and capstone work experiences. Next slide, please. CTE is not just about career placement, and while we are building our vocation on our vocational foundation, we are career and technical education aligned, which means our students leave BCPS with opportunities to obtain industry-recognized credentials, technical skills assessments, and dual and articulate credits as we have spoken to. CTE also offers alignment to high skill, high wage, and in-demand careers while preparing our students for transferable employability skills. CTE authenticates the academic content and rigor through its use of disciplinary literacy. Next slide, please. We are very proud to say that BCPS uh, CTE is currently leading the state of Maryland in regards to enrollment and percentage of high school students participating in a CTE program. As of 2021, we have 18,000 high school students in CTE, or approximately 52.58% of our student population. And this has increased from 11,000 students in 2014. We also have a strong work-based learning program with over 1,600 internships occurring last year for our students. Next slide, please. A priority for our um, CTE five-year plan, um, our first CTE five-year plan, was to ensure expansion of equity and access across our school system. We are now at nearly 40 different CTE programs of study and pathways, and we'll have at least three CTE programs of study in each high school, and all 10 career clusters represented in each of the three zones. We are in the process of developing our next CTE five-year plan, and it will be focusing on ensuring that CTE programs are consistently offered as either a magnet program or offered uh, comprehensively and open to all students. CTE has also engaged community members, the Office of Facilities, and a consulting firm to consider a new Northwest shared time center similar to the one found at Sellers Point. Next slide, please. CTE, too, is continuously reviewing and updating our programs of study against state and local uh, data, such as the Department of Labor. This has resulted in transitioning our drafting program into construction design management program, upgrading our food nutrition program of study to a pro-start program, and writing grants to expand programs of study, such as aviation technology and artificial intelligence, as previously mentioned. Next slide. And since 2019, CTE has covered all technical skills assessment fees for our students. This funding is used each year to ensure that no student has to pay for their technical skills assessment or industry-recognized credential. We have continuously increased our TSA and industry-recognized credential rate, and currently our pass rate for technical skills assessment uh, by our CTE concentrators is at 93.33% and 90.48% for industry recognized credentials. Next slide. But wait, there's more. CTE, thank you. CTE continues to expand our offerings such as our free week long summer camp for rising eighth grade students, our junior achievement inspire event each year for our current eighth grade students and our new CTE program pathway guide flyers to better inform parents and community members of our programs of study. We have also offered the, the NAEP program improvement process for equity, often referred to as PIPE, to disrupt gaps in equity and access. Our current career cluster participant enrollment nearly mirrors our school system demographics. I'll now turn this presentation over to my colleague, Dr. Zarchin. Take it away. Thank you. The Department of Schools engages BCPS offices and divisions to provide consistent and collective support so our students are able to learn at high levels. 
as the principal supervisors, the executive directors of schools monitor, coach, guide, and provide feedback to principals so effective structures are in place for quality teaching and learning to occur. They utilize multiple measures of data in conjunction with instructional walkthroughs of classroom lessons. They attend and participate in school leadership meetings, administrative team meetings, and meeting individually with principals to share feedback, coach, and provide direction as needed. Executive directors also participate in school progress plans. At the system level, they're involved in school improvement teams or system improvement teams as co-chairs with leaders in the division of curriculum and instruction. As part of the reorganization, our executive directors work with one level, elementary, middle school, or high school, while supporting the articulation process across levels and strategically working together to strengthen instructional leadership practices at all levels. Ms. Joseph and Mr. Mustafer serve as our high school executive directors and they share the responsibility for supervising our high schools. Part of their work includes examining the scheduling of courses, the master schedule, and student access to courses while also monitoring AP training for teachers. Providing all students with access to rigorous coursework is a shared responsibility. I'm thankful for the daily teamwork between the Department of Schools and the Division of Curriculum and Instruction. School counselors contribute greatly to this work and play a vital role in schools working with students to build on their potential and guide students' plans for the future. The six-year plan and advising session, sessions focus on the alignment of strengths and interests with high school course offerings extracurricular activities, internships, and dual enrollment courses. In determining the link between aspirations of high school offerings, students are encouraged to increase academic rigor. Courses can be identified by students, academic data, teacher recommendation, or tools like the AP Potential. This tool identifies students who have potential for success in AP courses. When students are taking the PSAT each October, high school counselors use this information to talk about rigor, which can be different from student to student. Based on preparedness, support, parent consultation, and encouragement, students may be recommended for gradual approach through honors courses or go directly into AP courses. Each year, counselors revisit the conversation to determine how students are progressing with the plan the previous year. Throughout this process, counselors collaborate with teachers to promote academic supports so students experience success in all of their courses. As mentioned earlier, the Early College Access Program is an opportunity for BCPS students to take CCBC courses aligned with interest and goals at no cost. Naviance so Scope and Sequence is a college and career readiness tool that offers activities and assessments for secondary students to explore interests that impact academic course selection. Students can find career pathways that support post-secondary plans to share with counselors during advisory sessions. As students learn more about themselves, counselors can refine academic goals to set each year. Collaboratively, we strive to have all students achieve high academic outcomes and continued success in chosen careers long after they leave BCPS. And there are a wide range of pathways to achieve those goals. At this time, I am proud to turn the presentation over to Ms. Jewel Ralph, Principal of Western High School of Technology and Environmental Science, for a glimpse of some of the great work going on in schools. Thank you so much. Western School of Technology and Environmental Science is a magnet school located in the Catonsville community of Baltimore County. Our school offers 11 magnet and CTE programs designed to prepare our 942 students for college or the workforce. 
Our student population is comprised of 471 males, 470 females, and one student who identifies as non-binary. The racial demographics for our student body is as follows, 529 black students, 169 Asian students, 154 white students, 44 multiracial students, two Pacific Island students, one Native American student, 43 students within the racial demographic identify as Hispanic. Of the total student population, 72 students have a Section 504 plan and 32 have an IEP. As we go through the next three slides, we will look just how Western Tech has put the blueprint for progress in action, specifically in areas of AP, dual college enrollment, and CTE. Next slide, please. As one of the county's premier magnet schools, Western Tech is laser focused on preparing our students to be college and career ready. One of the ways we continue to do this is by increasing AP performance. For, exa for example, while the 2021 national average for all students who have scored a 3% or higher on the AP exam is 23%, 60% of our graduating class of 2022 scored a three or higher on the AP exam. Looking at the trend data, Western Tech exhibits an increase in the number of students who took an AP course from 2018 to 2022, with 319 in 2018 and 336 in 2022. Due to the obvious impacts of COVID-19 pandemic, there was a slight decline in students who took AP courses for the 2020-21 school year. However, for the 2022 school year, 336 students took the AP exam. Of the 336 students, almost 90% scored a three or higher. I think that's worth repeating. <laughs> of the Western Tech students who took the AP exam in 2022, almost 90% scored a three or higher. As I stated earlier, we at Western Tech are laser focused on preparing our students for college and career readiness. Next slide, please. Western Tech is known for its cutting edge coursework and rigorous instruction. Our students start their magnet courses in their freshman year, and most have completed all their magnet courses by the end of their junior year. Students are actively encouraged to do dual college enrollment throughout their high school academic tenure. As a result, the dual enrollment is growing at a steady pace. For the 2021-22 school year, the Western students accessed over 97 college level courses. 21 of these courses were accessed primarily by our Asian and black student population. Because of our focus, the benefits of dual enrollment and our partnerships with CCBC, we project that our trend for accessing dual college credit courses will continue to increase. Next slide, please. Western Tech prepares our students through rigorous coursework and internships for college or career after high school. We have built partnerships with key medical systems, universities, and corporations to enhance our CTE and magnet programs. For example, our partnership with the University of Maryland Medical System has enriched our Academy of Health Professions, and our partnership with Baltimore Gas and Electric and Smith Mechanical has strengthened our mechanical construction and plumbing magnet programs. The students in our CTE programs are taking AP courses, passing them their exam, taking dual college courses, and getting internships with corporate partners. Let me personalize this data by giving you an example. Artie, one of our juniors, exemplifies what it means to educate the whole child. She is academically sound and involved in numerous organizations in and out of school. She started her own nonprofit organization while taking AP and dual college courses. This young lady has already taken eight, two AP courses and two college courses. She is currently enrolled in AP Calculus 
and AP U.S. History and is taking psychology at CCBC. Artie will be participating this year with the University of Maryland medical, Su medical system. Artie represents many students at Western Tech who take advantage of the programs that we've put in place in order to prepare for a college or career after high school. Let us hear from Artie now if we have the video. My name is Artie Srinivas and I'm a junior here at Western School of Technology. Here at Western Tech, we are encouraged to take AP courses, which give us a view into what college students experience in their classes. We are also encouraged to dual enroll in community college with CCBC courses. These courses help us take more specialized courses in college, but they also can help us graduate early. With that, I'm also a magnet student here at Western School of Technology in the Academy of Health Professions Magnet Program. We learn many clinical and administrative aspects of healthcare. This will not only help us with our future careers, but also with our hospital internship, which is coming up in the next upcoming weeks. My rotation is inpatient neurology, and I will be able to use the skills I learned here at Western Tech and apply them to my rotation. Thank you. We at Western Tech have a saying, be a Western Tech graduate or compete with one. Well, watch out world, our Western Tech scholars are coming. Thank you. Next slide, please. So this visual uh, will be made available for students and families on the BCPS website and board docs. This summarizes the multiple pathways and programs that we discussed tonight, and each logo is linked to the corresponding website for easy access of students and families. And I think, last slide. Yes, as you recall, last year we showed a running record of our uh, academic achievement reports, and just want to end on this slide. Thank you. Thank you. Give them a round of applause. Well, thank you for the outstanding presentation. I really appreciate it. I found myself wanting more from, from each slide, like we could hear a presentation on each bullet point. So thank you all very much. In the interest of time, um, we're not going to be discussing this at length, but I'm sure board members will be following up with questions and requesting additional discussion on several of the things we heard about. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Good evening. I just would like to acknowledge Dr. Heather Woodridge, our coordinator Office of College and Career Readiness, Dr. Michael Grubbs, coordinator of Career and Technical Education. Dr. Jeffrey Holmes, our senior executive director, and Ms. Kiria Joseph, one of our high school executive directors. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is board member comments and agenda setting, and I'll start with Ms. Rowe. Did she left? She's gone. Okay. Ms. Causey. Thank I'll wait you. till the end. Thank you. Ms. Tulesky. Um, Very quickly, yes, that college and career readiness update was um, just really a tribute to the great work and probably one of the best programs in the state, if not the country. Um, and, you know, just want to thank everybody for being a part of this school year and we're all in this together. Through the ups and the downs, the bottom line is everybody cares about every child in the school system, and that's why we're all here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Um, is Ms. Joes on the line by chance? She left the meeting. I didn't know if she was in teams. Mr. McMillian? Thanks for the presentation. I want to congratulate all the winners from yesterday. I'm looking forward to working with you. Uh, I want to thank, uh, a little bit early, but I want to thank the board members that are leaving. I had the opportunity to work with you. I had the opportunity to learn a great deal. I, I, I say this, and I mean it sincerely. I want to be a lifelong learner. I want to have one foot on my deathbed. I, have, I want to have one foot on the floor, and I want to be trying to learn something. 
and, and I'm really looking forward to it. The reason I ran again was because if, if I didn't, that, that four years, this four years would have been a waste to me. So I want to continue to learn. I want four more years. And, and I just want to continue to grow as a board member. There's a lot of this. This is technical stuff for the ordinary person. And, and you know, with the contracts and, and the legal piece. And, and I want to keep learning. And I want to keep moving forward. And, and I want to thank everybody that I work with for the opportunity to learn something from them. Because I know I've learned it from them. I've learned something. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mrs. Hahn? Thank you. Um, I'm not quite sure what else to add, but I do want to thank all of you. And as Mr. McMillian said, it is a little bit early to say goodbye. Um, and I know it for me, it feels a little rushed because I just met a lot of you a couple months ago. Um, but thank you so much for the hard work that you put in, um, even up until the last day of your tenure and your service on this Board of Education. I hope you take everything you've learned here and you apply it everywhere you go, and I hope you continue to love students, to love education, and most importantly, to love your communities. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Scott? Yes, thank you. Um, don't have any suggestions. I thank the staff and everything for the report, all the reports that you've given, and um, uh, I echo some of the statements that were made earlier as far as I've learned so much, and I'd like to congratulate um, those who are coming into the board, who, who won their elections, and um, I hope everyone has a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hager? Um, I, too, want to congratulate the new board members um, and uh, not that I, I know most people have been on the board longer than I have, but I certainly would ha be happy to be a resource moving forward if, if there's anything that I can do to help them. And I especially want to congratulate Julie and Rod for their re-election, which is very exciting. Um, and uh, as far as a new agenda item, um, something that was mentioned during public comment tonight was, had to do with the Area Education Advisory Committees. And I um, came to the board not knowing much about them, to be honest, and so I clearly learned about them over the past few years, but I do think it may benefit the public to learn more about kind of their function and how members are chosen and things like that um, in the future. I think that would be a, a, a good addition to the a board meeting. Thank you. And, and I would echo that. I would ask that um, our area advisory councils to use your speaker slots because you are a recognized stakeholder group as are all of our recognized stakeholder groups. You have that reserve time to come use it. It's it's yours for a reason. Use it to educate your communities. Before joining the board, I was chair of the Northeast Ad Advisory, and spreading awareness was always a challenge. So this is an opportunity. Also, when I, I joined, we had double-digit you know viewership of board meetings. Now I hear it about it. You know we're must see TV at, at PTA meetings. It's like wow, this um, you have an audience and you have. This, this opportunity to gain exposure and community awareness and get um, stakeholders involved. So would encourage all of our area advisories to, to come on out and, and talk to us and use this as a forum. Um, that said, the last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, November 22nd, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you all very much for joining us tonight. The meeting is now adjourned.